Hello guys and welcome back. What I'm going to talk about right now is a set of terms that you're going to see a lot when you are dealing with data science and machine learning. These terms are features, labels, dependent variables, and independent variables. Okay? Now, what are those exactly? I'm going to give you a very simple problem. Let's say that I would like to predict the price of a certain house, depending on location, size, construction year, and here is my price. What I would like to do is take these three right here and be able to predict a target price. Now those, we call them features. This, this, and this together all called features because those are the features that distinguish this problem and will help us to predict a label so this price here is called label so we have features which predict a label now mostly you will see these two terms features and label you'll see them in machine learning and data science now dependent variable is nothing but a label but this term is used in statistics but they are just the same thing now here as well we have independent variable which is nothing but a feature this is also the term used in statistics and this is the term used in machine learning so this is the main difference between features and label you will hear the term features engineering well, feature engineering is all about pre-processing your features and data so that it can be suitable for whatever algorithm you are trying to use to predict something. Let me tell you more about features, but in regard of image processing, let's say that I am trying to create a classifier that will distinguish a human body or a human being from a car okay it will tell me if i pass an image of a human let's say the human looks like this and let's say that we have a car here here we have two doors here we have the wheel here we have a light here let's say we have fingers here we have a shoe fingers a mouth eyes and some hair maybe let's say that you have multiple images of a human and multiple images of a car how can you teach a classifying algorithm what is the difference well the classifying algorithm is going to try to extract features from this human being let's say a hand it's going to extract a leg a mouth maybe eyes it might try to extract the roundness of the face or maybe it will try to extract separately the hair so all of those inside the algorithm will be like features and individual features each one of those is nothing now but a feature that the model used to recognize this now, when it goes to the car and it starts recognizing a car, maybe it recognizes it because it has wheels, it has a door, maybe from the window, maybe from the driving wheel, maybe from the light. It tries to collect features like that. Each of those become an individual feature. And then it tries to predict a label. And it says, if I see these features, is this a car or is it a human? And it produces a probability to what could this be? Like it is 70% that what I'm seeing is a human or maybe 70% of what I'm seeing is a car. So this is what is features in terms of images. The model you are training and developing the machine learning model that you are training to predict and classify 
is actually going to extract these small features. This is really true, especially for neural networks. When we will be talking about neural networks to classify images, this is what's happening inside the neural network. It is actually trying to recognize these patterns. Hello guys and welcome back. Okay, now let us introduce more terms. Whenever you are working in machine learning, you are going to notice the following. Supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Now, what is the difference between these two terms? We have talked about features and label. Okay, in supervised learning, you have multiple features. Like, again, let's take the example of predicting the house price. So here we have address, like or location, we can call it. We have construction year. And let's say size here. And label is actually the price. Okay. In supervised learning, we have an algorithm like this. We feed it to our features. And we feed it our labels in what we call the training phase. We are going to be training this algorithm here by feeding it features and labels. It's like the following. It's like you're saying, okay, this is house number one. Those are the features and this is my label. Try to learn the relationship between the features that produces this label. This is a very simplified way to explain it. We are going to go through the algorithms one by one when we reach there. But for now, just think about it like this. You are passing your algorithm, the houses or the feature, and you are feeding it as well the price that you want to predict. And you are telling it, hey, find the relationship between these features so that I can produce this price. And then you feed it the second house. Then you feed it the third house. And you keep doing that in the training process in the hope that if you give it a house without giving a label, it will predict something. Okay? This is the whole point. You give it features. You give your algorithm features and labels in the training phase. You try to find the relationship between features that will produce this label. And then when you are done training, you just pass it a house without the label. And you hope that it can predict the price. These are all the regressions. All of these are regression problems. Meaning we are trying to predict a number. Now this is what supervised learning is about. It's about providing this label. Okay? You need to tell it that those features will produce this label. Now, however, unsupervised learning is different. Now, before I move to unsupervised learning, I just don't want you to confuse that supervised learning is only about regression. It also does classification. But this house predicting problem is actually regression. Now, unsupervised learning, you provide your model with features, but you do not have any label. You only have features and you want your algorithm to find pattern between this data, these features, so that they can be separated from each other. So this is kind of a classification problem. Why do I mean that? When we started the data section, we have talked about clustering our data, meaning that we created data that were grouping on each other. So this is a bunch of data grouping on each other. This is a bunch of data that are grouping on each other. Unsupervised learning is going to find a way to order these features just the way I drew them. And then it is going to draw boundaries between them like this maybe and like this so that it is going to tell you this is category one this is category two, and this is category three. You did not provide any label to it. It's like giving it a pictures of the numbers zero, one, two. You're just giving it a bunch of pictures and you feed it to an unsupervised learning algorithm 
in the hope that it can order these images like this, draw boundaries like this, and then tell you, hey, I found the three categories here. You did not tell it that there is a difference between these data sets. You just gave it images without telling it what image is what label. You just fed images and you hoped that it will be able to find boundaries between these data so that they can be separated. This is what unsupervised learning is all about, actually. Now, let's give some examples on which algorithms are used for supervised and for unsupervised learning. So, for supervised learning, we have algorithms like linear regression, polynomial regression, support vector machine, naive bias, random forests. Now, all of those algorithms are supervised, and you are going to talk about them one by one. Next, we have unsupervised. We have algorithms like PCA, which we will talk about as well. We have k-mean clustering. Those are the most famous two. We also have some set of algorithms that are called manifold learning, and we will be visiting all of that. I just wanted to give you a quick overview about the differences between supervised and unsupervised learning. There is this topic that I would like to talk about, which is called data split. Let's assume that this is my Gaussian Bayes algorithm. I have my inputs here, meaning all my features, and here I am also feeding my labels, and we are training it. Let's say that I have a table of features that contains from feature 1 all the way to feature 7. And then I have my label, of course, at the output here. And let's say that I have entries starting from 1 all the way to 1000. Okay, all of those are entries. If I want to really evaluate how good my model is, how can I do that if I only train those 1000 entries? I mean, assume that I gave this algorithm all the 1000 entries at the same time and I trained on them. How would I know if I am performing well? Am I performing bad? I mean, I don't have any data to test anymore. This is why. Your data need to be splitted. So you have your data, you need to split it into training data. You also need to split it to a test data. It's very, very important to do that. Now, the percentages here training could be around maybe 80%, and testing could be around 20%. Okay? Sometimes we take testing to be 15%, and all the 85 are for training. By that, now you have a chunk of your data that you can use to test if your model is working or not. See what I mean? Otherwise, you'd have to invent new data and gather new data just to evaluate the model, and this makes no sense. You always need to split your data into two sections, one for training, then your algorithm will understand that this training data are my data. I'm going to try to parameterize my parameters so that I can do the best with this 80%, of course, with the labels. Then I bring these test data, all these test data, and I feed them here to my algorithm, and I don't feed my label, and I try to make it predict. So this model here is for training. This is a training model. And then I would have a testing model. My testing model would be my Gaussian bias, for example. Here I would feed it my test data, and here I will be recording the result. Record the result. I mean, no labels anymore. I'm not going to be providing any labels. I'm just going to be seeing the results. Now, since I am recording these results and I already have the actual results, right? This is recorded results and I have the actual ones from here because here I split my data which contains the answer. 
But when I'm feeding it to my Gaussian bias, I'm just feeding it without the answer. I'm trying to have it predict the answer. Now, it will predict the answer, store it in record results, and I have the actual results, which I brought from here. Now, I compare them, and I can calculate a percentage, which will be how accurate my model is, by simply saying, well, how would I do that in more details? Let's just take this model one more time. I will pass one test data. This is the first test, meaning maybe entry, uh, let's say entry zero. I passed entry zero here. And I recorded that it predicted one. All right. And let's say that my actual result is zero. It means that I have a false prediction here. And I'm going to record this. Then I bring my second test data. So this is maybe entry one. And the result is also one. And the actual here is one. So what I have now, I have one here, the prediction, and I have one, the actual. Okay, so now I have two entries. If I am to calculate, I would see that I got 50% of times correct results, and I got 50% of the times incorrect results. Why? Because I predicted correctly one time, and I predicted the wrong result another time. So this is a 50% meaning that my model accuracy is only 50%. So this is why we need to split our data because it's important to evaluate the performance. Let's talk about cross-validation. So far, we were evaluating the model by the following. We have a data, and we were dividing it into training or train data, and test data, right? Then we had our model right here. This is for training. And we had the same model here for testing, right? When we were training, we were feeding around 80% of the data. And when we were testing, we were feeding 20% of this data approximately, all right? If we would like to implement cross-validation, we need to change these percentages a little bit. We need to convert this 80 to 50%, and we need to convert this test to 50%. Okay? So I take half the data, I train with it, I take half the data, and I test with it. But as you can see, this is actually still a huge waste of data because I'm using only half my data to train. I mean, the more data I have, the better my model is going to be with training. But here I am actually throwing away around 50% of my data. The solution is we do something that is called cross-validation. Now, with cross-validations, we have two steps. Step one is I take my training data and I actually pass it to my, let's say, my algorithm, be it Gaussian bias, be it anything, and then I evaluate with my testing data. We were doing that so far. Now, the second step is going to be the following. I'm going to be training my testing data, since I already split it into two portions. Now, I am taking this testing data, I'm training with it, and then I'm evaluating with my training data. What did I do here? Well, I can see the performance of my model in a more accurate way. Because right now, I used almost all of my data in order to get a metric for the accuracy of my model. Now, now there is another technique called k-fold cross-validation. Now, with k-fold, we will divide this data into more portions, and we are going to pass them in between each other like this. Let's say we divide it into three sections. We will be training with the first section, second section, third section. We will be evaluating by the first, second, third test section, and we will be doing a huge loop that will evaluate and give me better metric on my accuracy. 
Okay, now we are going to be talking about what we call features engineering. This is actually a large topic and we are going to have an introduction about it so that we can solve at least our problems that we will be facing when we implement algorithms. Let's assume that we have some data. We have feature 1, feature 2, feature 3, and then we have, of course, a label. Okay, and let's see that feature 1 has values 31, 2.1, 70, here 2, 21, but I'm gonna leave here empty. Next here we have 121, I'm gonna have here 0 0.1, 0 0.2, I'm gonna leave this empty, and finally here I'm gonna be having some strings. Uh, let's say uh, data 1, but it's a string actually. Then here maybe data 2, and then here we will leave it empty. Then I'm gonna be filling these just randomly. Data 7, and so on and so forth. Okay? When you get data, it's not always complete. In a lot of cases, you would be having missing data because this information maybe could not be collected for any reason. And when you try to read this data, especially in libraries like Pandas, you are going to be having values here which are called NaN. So all the empty values are going to be NANs. Okay? When you try to pass these columns to your algorithm, if they contain any NaN, well, it's going to create a problem for the algorithm because it does not know how to deal with it. Assume that you are trying to take the average of feature 2, and you pass feature 2, and then the uh, library, let's say NumPy, sees that, okay, how do I add NaN to the average? This makes no sense. So feature engineering, one of its branching is called pre-processing the data, meaning that make it suitable so that you can go and just process it. Now there are multiple types that we are going to learn about in order to pre-process this. One, we will be learning when should we drop NANs. Meaning that if I see any NAN, I would like to drop maybe the whole row and just delete it from my dataset. Two, it is about filling the NANs with the mean value or the average value. Okay? Third is when I want to fill this NAN with maybe zeros zero values okay and lastly one of the issues as well when we try to work with strings here is that some of our algorithms will not accept strings it will say i'm expecting numerical numbers and you are passing me strings. how shall i process it so we need also a way to deal with the strings and the way to do that is by what we call encoding now encoding is about converting all the string values into numerical values, which we will be noticing some issues. If I, let's say, encoded data 1 that we have here, and I make it equal 1, and then I say data 2, I make it equals 2, this kind of encoding approach is also going to give me issues, because now there is a numerical number higher than the other, assigned to one of my labels here. So my algorithm might assume that the weight here is higher than the weight here. And this is something is not acceptable and it could create problems also when you are training your data. We are going to tackle all of these issues one by one and see how we can handle them. All right, now let's start with our first feature engineering data preprocessing technique. I'm going to be importing Seaborn. I'm going to be importing Pandas. And now we need to load some data. So I'm here, I'm going to say data is equal to sns.load dataset. And the name of the dataset I want to bring now is called the iris. Let me show you what is iris. This is iris. Iris is a kind of a flower. And there are multiple types of it, Versicolor, Citosa, and Virginica. And here, the dataset is giving me the dimensions of its sepal and petal. So if we take a look here to, and print this data, we will see that it contains uh, Citosa species, Versicolor species, and Virginica. Okay? If you are not seeing all of these right now, if you are not seeing the whole 
rows, you can simply just add the following, which is set option display max row and recompile again, and you should see all the rows. Now, we don't have any NAND values here or empty values. All the values are filled. But we have one problem. The species column is actually strings. And as I said, some algorithms have problems when you pass strings to them. They cannot really process it. So let's see what kind of encoding can we apply in order to get rid of these strings. What I want to explain right now is what we call the one-shot encoding. So we have one shot encoding let me give you an example let's say here that i have a feature or a label that is called water type okay it's a weird name but it's okay now let's say that we have ocean in my column i have sea and i have river we have learned about encoding when we were talking in previous sections, we said that one type of encoding is to assign a value to every string. So ocean becomes zero, sea becomes one, and river becomes two. The issue here is that we are assigning more weight to one label than the other. So maybe the algorithm will say river is more important than sea, or sea is more important than ocean because its numerical value or numerical weight is higher. We don't want that. We don't want to take this risk. What we use is, instead of this regular encoding, we use one-shot encoding. Let me so show you how it works. It will decompose this one column into three columns. One of them is going to be called water type underscore ocean. Then here we have water type underscore river. And finally we have water type underscore C, all right? Now what's gonna happen is water type ocean will be assigned one and this will be assigned zero. Since I will be passing all the columns to my algorithm, now it won't consider at all river and sea because they are zero and it will consider ocean being one. Now, next one is going to be zero, one, zero. What's going to happen here is, when we pass all the three, it won't take ocean and sea into consideration, it will take only river to consideration, and its value is also 1. And finally here we have 0, 0, and 1. Let me remove this. Okay. See? Now when we talk about C, we'll see that C is considered as 1, and these two are considered as 0. What we did here is we have assigned equal weight to all of them. So here we have weight of 1, here our weight is 1, and here our weight is 1. See, we don't have any problems when we are talking about a label being better than the other. Because when we say here it's 1, these two will be zeros. When we say this one is 1, these two will be zeros. So all of them are equal now. Now, let us see how we can implement this. All we need to do is the following. Let's say here data is equal to pd dot get underscore dummies and then you just need to pass the data. Now take a look what's gonna happen. Let me print the data. Here we go. Now we have three columns instead of one. First we had only one species. Now we have three columns. As you can see, Citosa is one here in all of those because it is Citosa. Now Versicolor starts here and all of them are ones. And for the Virginica, all of them are ones here and all the others are zero. So by that we have encoded the data set and now it's ready to be passed to our machine learning algorithm. All right, so let us continue now. We are going to say data is equal to sns.load underscore data set. And this data set will be the penguins, our beloved penguins, which we worked with before. Now, let's see these penguins. Hmm. As you can see now, we have a lot of NANDs. We have NANDs in the six label here. We have NANDs multiple places. As you can see, we have around 19 NANDs that we need to get rid of. Should we first encode those strings, like the species and the island and the sex, or should we actually do something else first. First, we need to fill the NANDs whenever it is suitable. Okay, this is the first step. 
So let's take this bill length millimeter first. There is two ways to fill this NANs. Either we fill them with zeros, or we can fill them with the mean value of all of these NANs. Okay? Let's do the first one. Let's fill them with the mean value. Because it makes more sense to fill it with the mean value. If you fill it with zero, you are disregarding this whole entry. In some cases, it is useful to fill zeros, but at least in these kind of problems where we have measurement units, it's better to fill them with the mean. How can I fill them? Well, I'm going to create a list. Let's call it L. And I'm going to put all the things that I want to fill. So I have this one, bill length, I have bill depth, I have flipper length, and I have body mass. All of those are numerical, and I would like to really fill them. Well, then I'm going to just loop over them. So for label in L. Now it's time to do that. We're going to say data label, meaning that data, whatever label I am iterating on right now, is equal to data label. Then I'm going to call the method, which is called fill an A. What do I want to fill this NA with? Well, I would like to fill it with the mean of whatever column I have. So right now, let's say we started with bill length. I would like to take the mean value or the average value of all of this bill length and just fill the NANs with it. So I'm going to say here data label dot mean. See what's going on here? I am taking this column, I'm taking its mean, and then I'm filling the whole column with it. Okay? And that's it. Now, if we print data at the end, we got a key error. Yeah, we have a space here. Let's remove it. And here we go. Now, we don't have any NANs around here. All of those now are just values. That's good. Now, we still have NANs in this column right here. How should we deal with them? Now, we still have values here, which are NANs. Here is the thing. If we are trying to predict this column, we should drop every NAND that we have because we cannot really risk assigning them random values like male or female randomly or maybe all males or maybe all females because we are trying to actually predict this and it will affect our result because this is the label, this is the outcome that I'm trying to predict and it will mess up my algorithm if I leave them when I am training my algorithm or my model. What I want to do is to get rid of them. And right now, NANs only exist in this column right here. Let's get rid of them. The way to drop all of those NANs is by using a method that is called drop an A. So I'm going to say here data is equal to data dot drop an A. And that's it. Now let's print data. You'll see that I don't have these entries anymore. Now, let me show you that we shrunk them actually. Before, let's remove this drop data for a second. We had 343 entries, okay? Now, after we drop the data, we can see that we now have less elements. Well, you might say the numbers here are the same. Well, because we did not re-index our, our data set. You'll see how here we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then we are jumping to 12. Let us re-index this now by saying data dot reset underscore index. Say data is equal like that. And now let's print data one more time. You'll see that now we have re-indexed them and we have 332 entries, which is less by around 11 entries. Okay, we have deleted those entries. And now my data set is almost ready. What do you think we still have to do? We need to encode this. Let's do the encoding. Data is equal to pd dot get underscore dummies, pass the data, and print the data, and we have encoded everything. Take a look here. We have the species, we have three species, we have the island, we have the three island, we have encoded them, and we have the male and female. Now take a look here. These can be considered as a set. So this is male, female, and here as well, these are encoded as a set. They are not encoded all together, of course, but they are encoded as a set. Here we have 1, 2, 3, here we have 1, 2, 3, and here we have 1, 2. And that's it. Okay, now let's get more serious into datasets. 
Now we are going to be importing data sets from different libraries and we are going to examine them. And then we will see how we can display them and depict them. The first thing I want to talk about is a library that is called Seaborn. Now Seaborn is a more advanced. Now Seaborn is a visualization library where we can create really beautiful diagrams. And we are going to see how we can do that. Also, Seaborn contains a lot of ready-to-use datasets. And today we will be introducing the Penguins dataset. Penguins dataset contains information about different penguins species, about the dimension of their organs, about the relationship between their body mass and different parameters of their body, if they are male, if they are female. Well, it's a really interesting data set which we will be working with now. First thing, we need to import Seaborn as SNS. Now, if you got an error, probably you need to install Seaborn first. We will open Anaconda prompt and say pip install Seaborn. And after we're done, we can use it immediately. Now, I'm gonna also import pandas. Now let's lo now let us load this predefined dataset. I'm gonna say dataset is equal to sns dot load dataset, and then I'm gonna say penguins, and I wanna print this dataset. As you can see, we have 344 elements of this dataset, and it contains species, island that exists in, bill length, bill depth, flipper length, and body mass, and sex. We have all of these information. Now, how about we examine all the dataset? I don't want to just see a chunk of it. We've done that before when we learned about pandas. We're going to say pd.set underscore option then say display dot max underscore row and then we need to pass none here pd is not in yeah pandas as pd and we're good now this is my whole data set as you can see as a species we have the adeli species we have the chinstrap species and we have the gento species now let's explore this species. I have already googled it for you. Here we have the chinstrap, this is the ginto, and this is the adeli. See there is differences between these penguins. Also this is the body parts. Here we are saying that we have the flipper and the bill. What is the flipper? Well the flipper is actually the arms of the penguin. Now these are the flippers here and we have the bill which is this one all right all right and by that we have introduced this nice data set now i'm going to show you how great this seaborn library is when it comes to visualization it can easily show you the relationships between multiple parameters let me show you if i am right now to show you the relationship between the bill length and the build depth okay with respect to every species we can do that very very simply using one line of code take a look if i say sns dot im plot then let's pass the x is actually my bill length I'm gonna copy it as it is and my y is actually my build depth all right it's like the mouth of this penguin or the bill then we need to specify the data the data is actually the data set we have which is this variable then with respect to what would i like to show the uh, bill depth and length is it with respect to the sex or is it with respect maybe to the island or to the species let's make it with respect to the species so here i'm gonna say u is equal to species of course species is a string so this is species Next, I can specify markers. So I'm going to say here markers is equal to X, O, and V. This is how should every category look like. Because I have three species, I am giving every species a special look. All right. Now, if I run this, uh, okay, this is LM plot. 
All right, take a look what happens here. As we can see, the data is looking like that. Look, the X's are for the elderly species. And here we can see the relationship between the length and the depth. And we see that for elderly at least, the relationship is not actually linear. As you can see, the data is scattered way too much around this line. This line is trying to approximate how the data looks like, but it's not really doing a good job. Now, take a look at the chin strap. This chin strap is a little bit more linear when it comes to the relationship between bill length and bill depth. Yes, there is some outliers, but it is way less outliers than, let's say, the Adili. Same thing for the Gento. The Gento as well is still kind of linear relationship when it comes to the relationship between length and depth. Now, see how we did that really quickly and really simply? All we needed to do is just specify what is the relationship I'm looking for, which is in my case the bill depth and the bill length, and then I divided it into per species by just passing here the hue equaling a species. Now, how about we separate these into three plots? I'm going to copy all of this as it is, and I'm going to be adding one more parameter, which is called column. Now, the column here is going to be species. So I'm going to be creating three plots for every species. Each one is depicting the relationship between length and depth. Okay, sorry, this one needs to be down here. Now let's run it. And here you go. Now you have each in a separate plot plot now how about we plot them according to sex so here instead of species i would like to see if there is any relationship with respect to sex now sex we have only male and female so we need only x and o and here we go we can see that we have separated the data to the penguin be it a male or a female now let's remove this column now, when we plot them together like that, you'll see that there is two clusters. You'll see that there is kind of two clusters. Now, when you depict them like that, you'll see that, well, there is a little bit of separation between the, between the bill for the male and female, but it's not really that big of a separation. Yes, there are some extremes here. We have some extremes here, but the overlapping is way too, but the overlapping is actually a lot. Now, how about we depict the flipper, okay? So let's say we want the relationship between the flipper length and the flipper width. So this is my flipper length, and here is my flipper width. Now, let's try to see if there is a relationship between body mass and maybe the length of the flipper, okay? Let's see if this is possible. So we need the flipper and the body mass. And let's say this is about species. And here we need to add one more symbol. So let's say W. Let's say V. W is not recognized. Maybe the V is. Okay, so V is recognized. Well, this is interesting. As you can see, the Gento is a little bit separated with respect to body mass versus the flipper length as a cluster. But for the chin strap and the Adelie, we will see that they are clustered above each other. So this is regarding clustering. Now let's try to plot them next to each other. So I'm going to copy this and just change the name to column to plot them all separately. Well, the relationship here is not really that linear, but at least we can see that it is not linear. What I would like you to do right now is to play around with this data and see what kind of relationship you can extract from it. What if there is a way that will automatically tell me if two parameters are related in some relationship to each other? Or at least give me a hint that, hey, maybe these two parameters, if you work them out, you might get some relationship between them. Maybe a linear relationship, 
maybe a non-linear relationship, but at least there is some coupling between them. The way to do that is by calling a function called correlation. Now, correlation is a huge topic in statistics, and SNS provides us with a method to calculate it and illustrate it. Let's create a variable that is called correlation, CRLN for correlation, and then we are going to apply it on our data set here. So it will take our data set and apply correlation on it. What we use to depict and illustrate data sets correlation is something called heat map. So if I say sns.heat map and I pass it this correlation that I have, we will be getting a heat map like that. This heat map tells me that the colors that are beige are very similar to each other. And as we go, lower in the color grade these parameters are kind of not related at all or the correlation could not find any relationship between them now you will notice that the diagonal here is actually beige meaning that these parameters are very similar and the reason is because we are calculating the similarities of the parameter with itself so here we have bill length bill length they are intersecting here it's beige build depth, build depth, inter intersecting here, it's beige. And it's normal to have them repeated like that because we are showing the relationships with all the parameters in our data set. Now, let's see what kind of parameters that are candidates to be similar. Well, I can see that the most candidates are these two squares right here. Let's see what they are. They are the body mass with the flipper length it means that there is a relationship between the mass of that penguin and his flipper length. And here it is showing that there is a relationship, again, with the body mass and the flipper length. Because here we are seeing it in the other way. So these two parameters are a good candidate for similarity. Now next comes maybe this one, which is the flipper length with the bill length. So maybe when the flipper is longer, maybe the bill is also longer. Or maybe it's some kind of a different relationship. But at least I know what parameters are similar to each other. Let us explore more of those cool methods that Seaborn provides us. How about if we plot all the relationships of all the parameters together according to a certain species or according to a certain male or female. Like right now, we were actually choosing these two parameters ourselves and choosing according to what we would like to plot them. How about we depict everything just all at once? Let's see how we can do that. And this is one of the most powerful techniques that we can use in Seaborn. So we're going to say SNS dot pair plot and we are going to pass the data set we have we would like to plot all of these parameters with respect to two things with respect let's say to sex all right and let's plot it and here you go this is all the relationships with respect to sex all of them look you have four parameters four parameters the blues are the males the oranges are the females and all the relationships for example if you take the bill length here you'll see that some of them are points and some of them are graphs the graphs is when you are comparing a parameter to itself let's say you are comparing the length of the bill but you are also distinguishing be between male and female and you can see here for example that the bill length is actually similar between male and female. Same thing here, we see that they are similar. Here, we can see that the female has more flipper length than the male. And we also, we can see here that the body mass of the female is more than the body mass of the male. Now, let's take a look at other relationships. Here is the bill length and here is my bill depth. And you'll see if there is a separation between this data. Remember when I told you about clustering? This is what I mean. I would like to see if I can separate these data from each other. 
Let's skim these plots quickly to see which data could be separated. We will see that build depth with flipper length can be actually separated. There is some overlapping, but we can actually get away with some separation. However, for example, the body mass and the flipper length, this data cannot be really clustered easily. So if you provide me with only these two parameters, it, I will be having a really hard time to separate them. So this is how we create pair plots, and it could work on any data set you have. And you almost don't have to write any code to see these relationships. Now let's talk about histograms. Histogram is going to help us display data to see the frequency of its occurrences. Let's say that you would like to know the distribution of the bill depth, okay? Which one is the most repeated? Which one is the least repeated? Let's see how we can do that using histograms. We are going to call the following method, which is called hist plot. We will pass it data equals penguins. Let's pass it the data that we would like to see its frequency. Let's say the flipper length, okay? Now we have the flipper length here, and we're done. Now, if I try to plot it, oh, sorry, it's not penguins, it's data set. Okay, now as you can see, here we can see the repetitions. You can see that a flipper length between 190 and 195 is the most repeated. And we can see that a flipper length between 170 and 180 is the least common and the least repeated at least for that data set. So by that we can extract a lot of statistical information just by plotting these one by one. Let's try plotting something like the body mass maybe. So if we plot the body mass, we will see that the most common body mass is around 3700 grams, which is around 3.7 kilograms. And the least common ones is around 6000. How about we depict something similar to histogram, which is called KDE plot. Now, KDE plot is really beautiful as well. So I'm going to say KDE plot. And we are going to pass the same parameters. We have data is equal to data set. And we have X is equal to body underscore mass underscore gram. Now, as you can see here, we are getting this nice line right here. Now, if I add a parameter like shade equals a true, you'll see that now we have this nice graph like this. It's smoothing it out to see the distribution better. It's smoothing it out so that we can see a more beautiful distribution. And by that, we have learned how we can use histograms and KDE plots. All right, now we are ready to start with our first algorithm, which is called Gaussian Naive Bayes, or some people call it bias. Now, this is a really, really simple and nice algorithm. It's very fast, and it can do a great job in, in classification. And it is actually based on the naive Bayes probabilistic algorithm and the Gaussian distribution. And this is, of course, an algorithm that is, that is categorized as supervised learning. Do you remember why? Because we need a label. Okay, so let's see how this cool simple algorithm works. Let's try to solve this simple problem. Let's say that we are trying to classify if a person likes to use his score or not based on a certain information. So here, let's say that this is people who like to use their car. All right, and here we have the people who don't like using the car. And let's say we collected some information and this information can be represented as follows. Let's say it depends on their consumption of fast food per day, how many meals. Let's say it also depends on how many times they exercise a week. 
and also and also how many kids they have as you can see we have these four categories and let's say that we have multiple samples for each of them here i'm going to say this is maybe the first sample second sample etc let's say that here we have around eat three meals a day all of them are fast food they exercise only once a week and they have two kids and here maybe we're going to say they eat once a week they never exercise and they have one kid and here maybe they eat four times a week they never exercise and they have no kids now let's fill the people who don't like to use the car for example let's say here that they don't eat fast food they exercise three times a week and they do have one kid and etc we can just fill these as we want all right now these are the data that we have how are we going to solve this problem with gaussian naive bias well first thing we need the gaussian distribution for all of these first let's start with people who like to use their car we are going to calculate the standard deviation and the mean for this data all of it okay so if we do that we would get let me draw this let's say that we got a gaussian distribution for people who like to use a car and for the number of times they eat fast food is like this this is the gaussian distribution for that and now let's draw the same thing the mean and the standard deviation for people who don't like to use a car for the number of fast food meals they eat per day and let's say that it looked maybe something like this all right now let's continue we will do the same thing for every category we have so now we are going to take this for the number of exercise times per week for people who like exercising and let's say that it looked something maybe like this and let's draw the same thing for number of exercise per week for people who don't like to use their car and the resulting gaussian distribution maybe looks like something like this now finally we will do the same thing for how many kids they have for each category so here we have this for the kids they have how many kids they have and let's say it looked something like this and the same thing would go for people who don't like to use the car and maybe it looked something like this all right so the first step is to draw the gaussian distribution now what is the next step now i want to show you something now let's say my data set here contains 40 people who like to use the car this is the number of data here so here i have all the way up to 40 and here i have all the way up to 60 okay so first we are going to calculate the probability that something like to use a car okay remember we have 40 people here and 60 people here now i'm gonna just be erasing those cool now the probability that somebody likes to use the car is actually depending on the number of samples so here i have 40 samples divided by the total number of samples so it is 0.4 and here the probability that somebody does not write like a car according just to my data here is actually 60 over 100 which is 0 0.6 right because i have 60 people and a total of 100. now this is the probability for if someone likes a car or, the, or does not now let's say that there is a new guy came in and says this is the new guy he looks like this and he said hey for me I eat two times a day fast food, I exercise two times a week, and I have one kid. Where should this be categorized? Is he a person who likes to use a car or does not like to use a car? Well, we need to calculate that. This is what Gaussian naive bias will do. And the way to calculate that is by summing the following formula. What is the probability that he uses car when how many times does he eat fast food a day two so fast food when fast food equals two giving that he uses a car okay this is what we call conditional probability and we can simply find it right here 
let me just label this quickly i'm going to say that this is for the fast food this is for the exercise and this is for the number of kids and also the yellow is for people who use the car and the red is for people who don't all right now we have labeled our information. What is the probability that he uses a car? Well, we have already calculated that, which is 0 0.4. And we need to multiply that by the probability that he eats two times fast food, given that he uses a car. Well, we will go to the fast food here, and we need to get the likelihood. The likelihood for the fast food. So it is in the yellow. Let's assume that we found that the likelihood exists here. What is the likelihood? Well, it is the y-axis here, actually. All right. So let's say we know the number of times that he... Let's say that here is the 2 for the fast food, right? So the likelihood is located just right here. All right. And let's say that this point here equals to 0 0.1. All right. That's so good. Now we need to add to this term after we calculate this plus we need the probability that he uses a car multiplied by the conditional probability that he exercises two times a day given that he uses a car. Again, here we have 0 0.4 and then we need to locate the likelihood of exercising when using a car, let's assume that it is somewhere maybe here. I'm just making random guesses right now just to show you how it works. Now, this will be multiplied by, let's say, 0 0.01 or maybe 2. And we continue. Now, we will say plus. Same thing, probability that he uses a car multiplied by the conditional probability that he exercises, not exercises, sorry, that he has kids, let's say one kid, given that he uses a car. And then we do the same thing. Here we will say 0 0.4 multiplied by, again, we need the yellow, let's say it is right here. Let's say that we are multiplying this by 0 0.017. And then we add all of these results together. And let's say the final answer is, I'm not going to be calculating this. Let's just say that the score is 0 0.03. Okay, this is just a random guess. And I will be registering this. So what we did here, we started with an initial guess saying that, well, this person here likes to use a car. And we got a score of uses a car. Let me register this over there. Probability that he uses a car is equal to 0 0.03. Okay, now we are going to repeat all of that, but for a different guess. And this different guess is going to be that he does not like to use a car. So I need to calculate the following. I need the probability that he does not like to use a car will be multiplied by the conditional probability that that he eats two times a day fast food given that he does not like doesn't doesn't like to use a car okay so we will be substituting this what is the probability that a person does not like to use a car it is 0 0.6 and we need to multiply that by the likelihood but the likelihood that will be used here is those red ones because these are the ones for these are the distributions when somebody does not like to eat fast food. In our case, let's make it here. And, well, let's say that this equals to, let me remove this. Let's say that this equals to, to 0 0.04. And then we will be continuing. Probability that he does not multiplied by the conditional probability that he exercises, which is equal to 2, given that he does not. And again, we do the same calculation, 0 0.6 times we need to locate where is the likelihood here for exercise 2. Let's say it is here. So let's say that this is 0 0.0002. And again, we do the same thing for the last one. Probability that he does not. 
Of course, we are summing these terms. Just don't forget this plus this plus this. No. Of course, we are summing all of those. So this plus this plus this doesn't. Probability that he doesn't multiplied by the conditional probability that he has kids equaling 1 and he does not. And again, we substitute 0 0.6 times, let's say that it is right here, and this is maybe 0 0.3. And finally, we calculate this and we get a final score, and let's say it equals to 0 0.07. So we come here and we say the probability that he does not use, which is the calculation of all of that, is 0 0.07. Now we compare which one is higher. This one is actually higher, right? It means that this person actually does not use a car, depending on the information, the information given. Now, this is some detailed example on how Gaussian bias. Now, this is some overview on how Gaussian naive bias works. Now, there are more details, the algorithm, but this should give you enough understanding on how you can use it. Now, we are going to go to Python and write this algorithm, but we won't be writing these details. But what I want you to note is that when we are training Gaussian naive bias, we are actually forming those gaussian distributions right here this one this one and this one for every feature this is the whole point of when we say training gaussian naive bias so that it can make future predictions it's all about those gaussian distributions the title of this lecture is social media campaign let's say that you are working for a social media company and they provided you with a data set containing clients they collected on the internet and according to some information some of them bought the product they are trying to market online and the others did not buy that product and your goal is to classify or to predict what are the factors that help purchasing that certain product let's say that this company gave you something like a client id address his age, his approximated salary or income, the gender, and finally, they gave you a column that says, did he purchase or did he not purchase? And with your current knowledge, you need to solve this problem. So far, we know about naive bias. So let's use now the algorithm that is called naive bias or naive base, the Gaussian one, to solve this problem. We are going to start by importing a couple of important libraries. The first one is called Pandas. And, and the second one is from sklearn.naive underscore base import Gaussian naive base. Okay? Let's get started. What is the first step? The first step is to see this database. Well, we are going to use the panda function to do that. We're going to say pd.read underscore csv. Okay, now let's put the path here. By the way, you can download this database, which is called Who Bought Social Media Campaign, from the attachments here. And you also need to change this path so that it is compatible with where you have located this file. Okay, now let's observe and see what does this file contain. So here we're going to say data.head. Here we go. We have the ID, the sex or the gender. Here we have age, salary, and purchased. Purchased, if it is zero, it means that the client did purchase this product. Otherwise, if it's one, it means he does not. Well, as you can see, if we expand this more, we have 400 entries, which should be enough to predict this simple pattern. Hopefully, we can find a pattern in the first place to predict. Let's do some relational plots in between all the features that we have. I'm going to be importing here import seaborn 
as SNS and we will simply say SNS dot pair plot and then the data well actually the ID is totally useless here observe this column here why would I need an ID in order to predict a purchase in order to predict if a person purchased something from the marketing campaign or not it makes no sense so let's drop it actually I don't want the ID at all in my data set so my data here is going to equal to data dot drop what do we want to drop well we just need to drop the ID and here we have the axis which equals to 1 and here we go now this is much better now Seaborn is going to automatically not blot your string based columns so as you can see here we, we can see all the relationships between let's say age uh, salary purchased and the relationship in between them now let's take a look at the age for example here we can see the age between 20 and 60 and mostly they are located around 40. next we can see the salaries which is ranging from less than 50,000 all the way to 150,000 and most of them are just located just above 50,000 we also can see here that most of the uh, clients in my data set did not actually purchase less percentage did purchase now let's take a look at the age and salary versus the purchasing we will see that if you take a closer look people that are up until this point let's say around 25 never purchased anything can you see here i mean look here we have only two lines either purchased or did not purchase if you take a look here this portion here has a gap meaning that nobody purchased in this range which is from 20 or less up until maybe 25 and for the other ages we can see that they are overlapping meaning that we cannot really tell now here the salary as well it's overlapping so the salary maybe is not doing a very good indicator on its own all right so by that we have studied our relationships and the relationships between data a little bit and that's really good actually we already started some pre-processing when we dropped the id here what's left for pre-processing is actually encoding the gender or sex column right here and we should do that using the one hot encoder but i'm not gonna be doing that immediately first i want to prepare my training data and my testing data we have talked about the training and testing data before and we said that it's important to split our data into training and testing so that we can take this testing data and evaluate if the model is performing well or not now we are going to see all of this in action first i'm going to be importing some new things here i'm going to import from sklearn.model underscore selection import train underscore test underscore split okay this is the first thing that i would like to import now take a look here we are going the training data is usually labeled as a large x okay now what should be my training data which features should be here to train id is already dropped right and we still have the sex age and salary well i'm going to be taking these three and i don't want the purchased because the purchased is my label or my outcome right so first we need our features features are going to be everything except the purchased so we can take the whole data set and just drop the purchased right i don't want the purchase to be in because this is my prediction label okay now here we need to say axis is equal to one now just execute this let's print x we will see that id is still here because we did not actually uh, execute the cell and we executed the cell which loaded the data again so let's remove this line for now 
and let's drop the id from here so i'm going to say id now we have our data what's next i would like to put my labels in a different variable and we do that by calling a variable a small y now what is my label it's only this outcome right this is my label the purchased so i'm going to say here data purchased now if i am to print my y you'll see that it contains the label all right why are we doing that because when we are creating our gaussian naive bias or any any prediction model we need to pass the features separated from the labels this is why we are doing this okay so the first step to do is to get your data select your features put them together and put your label alone now if you don't know what i'm talking about please go back to the features engineering and data pre-processing sections where we are covering the meaning of features and labels and etc okay now what's the next step i'm gonna be splitting my data how do we do that we will be defining four variables the first one is called x train which is a portion of my features here will be my x train and the remaining will be my x test okay so x here is feature so here it's like feature train and here i have feature test now i need to take 80 percent of my labels so here i'm gonna say y train and i need 20 percent of my testing right so here we have y test okay so we split this into two sections x train and x test and we split this into two sections y train and y test we will be using only the train to train our model and when we want to evaluate the model if it's doing okay we will be using x test and y test now here i'm going to say train underscore test underscore split and then we need to pass all of our features x all of our labels y and then we need to say test size is equal to let's say 0 0.2 here i'm saying that the testing data needs to be 20 percent okay and that's it now let's take a look at our x train this is my x train nothing seems strange if i print the length of my x train to see how many elements do i have you'll see that i have 320 now if i print my x test you'll see that i have 80 entries there if i print my y test we should be getting 80 as well and my y train is 320 so this value and this value are consistent and this value with this value are consistent this is how we split our data now it's time to use our gaussian naive bias the way to do that is by just creating a variable that is called model and now we are going to say here gaussian mp okay what's next we need to fit this model so we're going to say model dot fit x train and y train what is model fit and what is model here in any way so model is a variable that will hold the object for gaussian naive bias so we are initializing that we would like an object of gaussian naive bias next we need to fit it do you remember when i showed you how we take data and we draw the gaussian distribution this is what fitting is it is like you're preparing those gaussian plots so that we can do some predictions and you can think about it that this is training the data this is why here we are passing the 80 percent data consisting of x train and y train okay and that's it now we have trained it let's start and make some predictions now we are ready to evaluate our model we are going to use this portion of data which is called x test which is around 20 percent of my data and we are going to predict it using this model here okay 
we are going to predict those 20% uh, of data to see if they purchased or not. We are going to predict them one by one. So we are going to pass here this whole X test and just observe the results. I'm going to create a variable which is called Y predict. Those are my predictions and I am letting my Gaussian naive bias model do all the prediction. I'm not going to provide him with any answers. I'm going to give him data and I want him to do some prediction. I'm going to say here model dot predict. What do I want to predict? I'm going to be passing those 20% of data all together. Okay. And I'm going to be just printing Y predict just to see how it looks like. Well, we have an error. Okay. We forgot a large thing. We forgot to actually encode our data. We forgot to encode our sex column. Okay. Let's do that really quickly. It means that we were able to actually do some fitting but we only got an error when we tried to predict. All right, let me fix this really, really quickly. I'm going to go to the X here and I'm just going to say X is equal to pd.get underscore dummies and pass X again. Okay, and here I'm going to print X. We have a small typo here. Okay, now take a look. We have encoded this. So X is fixed. Now let me repeat these two one more time. And here we go. We got our predictions, which are 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's good. You might be saying, but I don't know what I am predicting. Well, where is my features that are producing these results right here? My features are already inside this X test, actually. So if I just print X test here, you'll see that these are my features ordered. But the point of me doing this model predict on X test is not to actually take a look at X test and just see the Y prediction. No, no, that's not my point. What I want to do is I want to calculate accuracy because right now these results are what my model predicted for me. But I actually have the actual results. It's like I am a teacher and I am letting my student solve some questions and I have all the answers and I can compare every student if he answered correctly or not, right? It is the same thing here. Those are the students right now. Each is answering to his own knowledge. And then I have all the answers. Where all those answers? All of them are in Y test okay all the answers are here now what i need to do i want to find a way to check every entry to see if it is matching the correct answer or not there is a very very useful function which is called accuracy score let us import this i'm going to say here from sklearn dot metrics i would like to import accuracy underscore score and I'm just going to say here accuracy underscore score. And I need to pass it the actual data, which is the answers that I am keeping away from the model. And what the model predicted, which is my Y prediction. Okay. Now, if I hit enter, I will get a percentage. It means that here I am 88.75% accurate about my result. So my model is predicting correct answers up to 88.75%. Now let us implement some cross validation. To do that, I'm going to be training my data at 50% here. I'm going to be splitting it at 50% first. And then I'm not going to be running this portion of the code right now. I'm going to create a new portion. Click here, press B. Okay, let's create a cross validation based training and accuracy calculation. I'm going to say here y1 underscore model is equal to model dot fit exit train and y train. Now it's time to predict. I'm going to say model dot predict. And then we are going to say x underscore test. Now, I can put these two statements together. If I just got this and say dot predict x test, it is the same thing. Now, let's create y2 model and just say model dot fit. This time we need to pass x test and y test. And then what do we need to predict? 
the training. Now we are training with the testing and testing with the training. So here it's going to be train. All right. Now let's calculate the accuracy. Now let's do the score evaluation. I'm going to say print model one. And then we are going to say accuracy underscore score. Let's take it for model one. We need to pass y underscore test. And we need to pass y1 model, right? It is the same as this statement. We take the y test and the predicted values, which are in y1 model. And now we need to pass here the y train and the y2 model, right? Because in this statement, training is testing and testing is training. Let's do that. Uh, we have a typo. Yeah, here. Here we go. You can see that my model one got an accuracy of 87% and the second model, here it should be model two actually, second model got an accuracy of 90%. So as you can see, this is giving me a better metric of how good my model is. We can take the average of these two values and produce the final accuracy. Now let us plot some confusion matrices just to practice it. We are going to say from sklearn dot metrics import confusion underscore matrix. We are going to say here confusion matrix is equal to confusion underscore matrix and we just need to pass our y test and our y model. Let's pass the ones that are here. So I'm going to say y test and I'm going to pass y1 underscore model. Now we need to plot it. How do we plot it? We plot it using Seaborn. Did we import Seaborn? We did import Seaborn. So here I'm going to say sns.heatmap and all we need to do is just pass cnf as well the annotation equaling true and the C bar equaling false. Okay, we forgot a comma here. <laughs> we are full of typos right now. Here we go. Now, as you can see here, we are getting the scientific notation. Now, to remove this scientific notation, all we need to say is FMT for formatting is equal to parentheses 2, 3, G. Now, if we run this, we will see that we don't have the scientific notation anymore. Now, as you can see, if we pass 2 here, we will get it back. So let's keep it at 3G. And as you can see, we got 118 times correct answers when the prediction was 0 and the actual value was actually 0. Okay, so we have mistakes here, around 15 mistakes, and we have around 10 mistakes here. Now, let's pass the other ones. I'm going to pass Y train here, and I'm going to pass Y2 model. You'll see that now the results are a little bit better. Now we are confusing ones with zeros eight times and zeros with ones 11 times, and the other answers are correct. So as you can see, confusion matrix can give you an indication on where did your model go wrong exactly. So far, we have successfully trained our model on our data. But the whole point of any model is that if you have new data, you would like to see its results. Now let's assume that we become new data and we would like to actually predict it. How do we do that? I'm going to create a list for the new data. I'm going to call it new data and it's going to contain the information we have. Now let's see the information format. If I am to print X here right now, You'll see that I am plugging in age, salary, and then gender as encoded like this. Can we imitate this format? We can do that very simply. We can pass the age. Let's say that if the age is 45 and if the salary, let's say that this new person that we are trying to predict has a salary or an estimated salary of around 45,000. And let's say that he is a male. So here we are going to pass 0 and 1, right? Because to be a male, we need here to have 1, and for female, it need to be 0. Okay, now, 
how can we predict this? All we need to do is just say model dot predict and then open a parenthesis like this and just pass the new data. And as you can see here, the result is zero. Okay, since we are returning this array, you can just pass the first entry and you'll see that the result is zero. Now let's try to change the parameters a little bit. Let's say the age is 39 and the salary is 60,000. Also zero. Let's switch to male. Again, zero. Change the age to 50. As you can see, we got one. All right, so this is how we predict new data. All we need to do is just pass it as a list into our prediction model. All right, we are going to talk about a new cool algorithm, which is called principal component analysis. What can we actually do with this algorithm? Let's take an example. Let's say that we have collected some data. These data look actually alike. This data could be about people characteristics, people behavior, could be anything. Let's give an example. Let's say that here I have the height of a person, the weight of a person, how many working hours does this person work, etc. And I have samples, which are these samples. I have one, two, three, etc. Okay, let's say the first person is 182 centimeters, maybe he weighs 85 and he works 12 hours. This one may be 171, weighs 63 and he works for 10 hours. Here it could be 174, weighs 90 and works five hours it could be any data now this data here maybe it's similar but i want to find the relationship between them the way to do this is by just plotting each two pairs let's say i have height and i have weight All right now let's say i have way more points than this and let's say that i have found an almost linear relationship between them Okay, now let's plot the second one. Maybe here we have working hours and we have weight here. Maybe maybe the less working hours, the more the weight is. Maybe this is an inverse relationship. And we can continue to plot all the relationships together. Let's say here we have uh, the height and the working hours. And let's say we got some really unusual data because maybe they are not related at all so by that we can take a look at the relationship between the data and we can actually plot them in 3d right so since we have only three coordinates here we can just create a 3d plot like this like this this is my x y and this is my z and i would be plotting all the points in the 3d space right to see the relationship between each other let's say x is height y is working hours and then we have the weight on the z-axis definitely we can do that but is this really practical imagine if i have around 10 features how would i even do that do i need to draw a pair of visualization for every two features this makes totally no sense this will take a lot of work and needs a lot of manual labor to check the relationship between each two and even if i want to try to draw it in 3d i can draw three features and assign them to xyz but if i have four features how would i draw my axis i can only draw in 3d dimensions so this is why this is not really practical and what we recite to is by creating a principal component analysis graph okay it looks like this we call this let's say component one principal component one and this we call it principal component two and then this algorithm is going to map out these 10 features and cluster the features that are close to each other okay 
So we might say see something like this, something like this, and something like this. Now it will create clusters for me and it will divide my data. It will tell me that these data are related to each other right here. So I have just clustered them for you without you having to draw all of these and try to extract relationships. Also, one more thing to note that the data that are on principal component 1 are more different than each other than the components on the principal component 2. What I mean by that, that this pair here on the PCA1, or you can call it the x-axis, are more different than each other than if I am to compare it this data right here. They are more different, all right? This is also an information that we can extract from here. Now, after we have clustered, we can map out those points again to our data, and we can tell which data is clustering together. If you don't still understand what are these points, those points are nothing but the features. So let's take these three points. Maybe these three points that we have clustered here, one, two, three, are nothing but height, weight, and working hours. And we can see them that they are clustered together, meaning that they are highly correlated, right? Maybe those are for the other features that we did not actually mention. So we can easily map them back to see. Now, PCA is, of course, used for predictions to predict where does this entry in the data set belong in a clustering uh, PCA graph. But also we use it to get insight on the data. Usually when we have multiple features, like maybe 20 features or 25 features, it's very, very hard to find correlations between them. So what we try to do is we pass them to a PCA and it will map them like that. And we can quickly see which data is related to each other and which data is not related to each other. So it's great to get insight on a certain data set or a certain statistical problem. Okay, now let's get deeper into principal component analysis. Let's assume that we have two features that we have collected from people. Let's say it is height and weight, all right? And let's say that we have around six samples from one all the way to six. And they are filled in a certain way. Now, how does PCA actually work? Graphically, we can draw up to three features, but the math can do any number of features, doesn't matter. So whatever we're going to learn here can be generalized to any number of dimensions. Even though we cannot draw it, the math can still hold and can be applied without uh, illustrating it. So let's start here. I'm going to be drawing my data. Let's assume that we have four points instead of six. All right, so that we can easily draw them. Let's say that we have point here, one point here, one point here, and let's say one point here. Let's say that this is the weight and this is the height, doesn't really matter. And these numbers are does not really reflect here accurately, but we just want to uh, clarify things. All right, so the first thing you do is that you actually project these into the h-axis or the height axis and the weight axis so if we project them like this this is what would happen all right now what we need to do is to actually calculate the average of these points on the w-axis we projected them right what do i mean by projecting them it's like think about it like you have put these dots and they are now on the w-axis directly okay so it's, this is what projection means. Now, if we take the average here, after they are projected, the average value, let's say that it is located right here. We will do the same thing and we will project all of this data on the h-axis, like that. And then we will calculate the average again. Let's say that the average of this point is actually around here. And now we need to connect these two averages together to get a new point. 
Let's say that the new connected point is, after we have connected the two averages, is actually around, let's say, here. Okay? Now, we are going to do some shifting. We are going to choose those four points, the red ones and the white point, and move them to the origin. All right? So this white point needs to be at the origin, and the spaces between the red points and the white point, which is the center, need to stay the same. So it's like cropping this section and just putting it on the center. Let us do that quickly. This is my center. Those are my points. Okay, so as you can see, the shape of these points is still the same. We just shifted them from this place all the way to this place. This is what we've done. All right, now what's the next step? We need to find the best fitting line. How do we find the best fitting line in here? Well, we need a line that fits this data the best, okay? How do we do that? Well, let's say that this is the line here we are starting with, okay? What we need to do is we are going to project those points on that line, say here, say so we projected this we need to project this as well let's say here and then we need to project this one and we need to project this one okay and now what we are going to calculate is the distance of every point to the origin so this is the projected point we need to calculate its distance to the origin so from here to here for the first point now the second point is going to be from here to here right from the blue one to the white one okay now let's say for this blue dot we need to calculate the distance from here to here and we are going to write them so let's say this is distance one we are going to say distance one okay and then after distance one we need to say this is distance two this point is distance three and this point is distance four okay i hope you are seeing what i mean here so we just sum up all of those distances together all right now let's say that we got a number of i don't know 12 all right doesn't really matter now we are going to repeat this multiple times so let's memorize that the first distance is 12 i'm gonna just erase that now we are going to try a different line Let's say that the line now looks like this. We need to project all of these data points. So this is data point one. We calculate the distance to the origin. And then this is data point two we projected. And then we calculate the distance to here. Then we have data three, etc. And we need to calculate this small line. And that's it. And then we record all of those. All right. Now we call every distance that we have calculated the sum of squared. Okay, so let's say sum squared for the first line is 12, sum squared of the second line is 20, etc. And we take the highest one, okay, and that would be our line, the one with the highest distance. Let's say that our line looks something like this, okay? This is the line that maximizes the distance. Now, we call this line, actually, the PCA1 line. All right, and now we get the slope of this one, the slope of this line. Now, what this slope tell us that if we move, let's say, three units here, we will be moving only one unit here, right? This means that a change on W of three units is yielding a change of one unit on H. So W is really important because it's yielding a lot of variation here. Now, if I draw this line right here, this is what we call the eigenvector. You will hear the term eigenvector whenever you are working with PCA. And this is it. It is actually a measurement of the variation here. And as you can see, this is how we just extract it from these two vectors that we have calculated after we draw the PCA1 line. So whenever you hear eigenvectors, now you know what they are talking about. Now, the next step, after we've done that on the PCA1, we would like to project everything, but this time on PCA2. Well, 
PCA2 is actually a very simple line. We can draw it just perpendicular to the PCA1 line. So we can simply just draw a perpendicular line here. And this will be my PCA2. So this is PCA2. Why is PCA2 important? Well, I'm just going to draw another graph because this is getting crowdy. Now take a look. This is my PCA2. And this is my PCA1. Perpendicular to it. All right. And those are my points. We have a point here. We have a point around here. We have a point around here. And we have a point around here. Now, what we need to do is to project those points on PCA1 and PCA2. Let's make the PCA1 projection. So the first point, this one, is going to be projected here. This point will be projected here. This one will be projected here. And this one will be projected here. Okay. Now, we will go again on this point. This will be projected here. This will be projected here. This will be projected here. And the last one will be projected here. Okay. And just by the way, before I forget, the vector here is called the eigenvector for PCA2. The same way we have created an eigenvector for PCA1, this is the eigenvector for PCA2. Okay. Let's continue here. Now it's time to rotate back everything. So this is my PCA1 right now. And this is my PCA2. All right, we have rotated it back. And those are my points. They are still there. Let's say that we have point one here, one here, two here. And let's say that we have two points here, like that, and two points here. Now, all we need to do is to actually connect the samples together. Because every sample, we have projected it on the first PCA axis and the second PCA axis. We can just reconnect them together. So let's say this is point one. Let's say this is point two. Let's say this is point three. And this, let's say this is point four. As you can see now, we got clustered data. Can you see that? We had data that are just plotted according to the features. And we ended up with clustered data that are separated from each other. Now, all of these mathematical terms that I said, eigenvectors, calculations, projection, all of that is actually a whole mathematical formulas that you need to apply in order to get these results. And they can be applied to any dimension. I try to visualize it to you so that you can understand what's going on under the hood. But in reality, all of that is done just using pure math. So if you go back to pure math, you can see that you can apply this to any number of features. Doesn't really matter. Now, these eigenvectors are mentioned many, many times. But what are they? I mean, why am I giving them such importance? See these arrows that I drawn here? And here, and I told you, this is the eigenvector for PCA2 and PCA1. Well, it is the same value as the squared distance that we have created. Remember this highest value? Well, this is actually the same thing as saying that this is the eigenvalue. And why it's important? Because it is showing me variation. Okay, so this is my eigenvalue 1. How is it showing me variation? Well, if I just say where distance PCA1 divided by the number of samples minus 1, I would get the variation of PCA1. I'm going to show you in a minute why it's important to get this variation. Now, if I take the same thing for PCA2 and I divide it also by N minus 1, we get the variation of PCA2. Now, just for the sake of example, I'm going to say that PCA1 is equaling to 12 and PCA2 is equaling maybe to 4. You'll see that the variation for PCA1 is higher. It means that PCA1 is more important than PCA2 because it has more variation. What do I mean by variation? It means that the data is spreading out on the PCA1 axis more. 
If you remember when we talked the last time, I told you that the PCA1 measures how different data is from each other. And the more the variation, the better, meaning that we are having more distance. It means that we are having better clustering. So most of the information is actually condensed in PCA1 on the PCA1 axis and less information is condensed in PCA2 axis. This is why we have a plot that we usually plot for PCA, which is called a scree plot. Now, what is a scree plot? A scree plot is going to be like the following. It draws here PCA1 and PCA2. And then here we will have the variation percentage. All right. So how do we calculate the percentage? We just need to calculate the total PCAs and divide each one of them. So here we have. 12 divided by 16 because it's 12 plus 4 and here we have 4 divided by 16 for PCA1 we got a result of 75 percent and for PCA2 we got a result of 25 percent all right and as you can see the variation on PCA1 is way higher this is why eigenvectors are very important because well they tell you the, that where is the most variation is being held in which PCA. Now, PCA is usually equal to the number of features that you have. Okay, so let's say that we are drawing on 20 features. Most of the time, and in a lot of the time, in well-separated data, we will see that PCA3 is less, PCA4 is even less, PCA5 is even less, most of the time. So we see that it's enough to plot only PCA1 and PCA2. This is why PCA is great for representing in two dimensions, because most of the information after calculation will be collected in only two axes. Welcome back to you guys, and now it's time to implement some PCA. I'm going to be using the data set that we have used before, which was about an online marketing campaign. We had few features that we have collected from the people who purchased and who did not purchase. And then we were trying to predict if that person purchased or not based on those criteria we have collected. Okay, now we have used the Gaussian naive bias on this data set before, but now I'm going to be using PCA. So here we are loading the data. I'm not going to rewrite this. And as you can see, we have sex, age, salary, and purchased, and the ID. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is drop the ID and then create my features. Now, remember that PCA is an unsupervised learning algorithm. It means that we don't need to split the data and tell it that these are my features and this is my label. I can just combine everything together pass it to the algorithm and just let it decide uh, these values, okay? So first, I'm going to be passing the purchase along with it, all right? And let's see how PCA is going to divide them. So here, I'm just uh, dropping the ID because it's unnecessary because the ID should have nothing to do with deciding if a person purchased something or not. And then I am encoding the strings that we have in the data set so the final data set will look something like this okay now how do we start with pca well you don't have to write anything barely a couple line of codes but it is important to understand what was happening under the hood so that you can do some sense evaluation of what's going on so we're going to say from sklearn dot decomposition import pca First thing we want to do is create a variable called model and then called PCA. And we need to specify how many PCAs do we want. Do you remember when we talked about PCA, how we ended up with multiple uh, PCAs? And then we chose the first two because they contain the most features. And, and since this is what happens most of the time, we are going to be choosing two PCAs. So I'm going to say here, n components equals two. Okay, we need only two PCAs. Now we need to fit the model. What do I mean by fit? Well, do you remember when we were projecting the data into the axis of the features? This is what fit will do. It will perform mathematical operations to just do those projections. What data do I want to fit? Of course, it is the X data. 
Now we need to do some transformation. I'm going to create a variable called transform, and then I'm going to say model.transform x. Now what is transformation? Remember when we did this final rotation of the PCAs in order to get PCA1 and PCA2 correctly? This is what transformation is. Now, the next step is to see what does this transform contain. So let's print transform. You'll see that it contains multiple lists, each containing two columns. The first column is actually the PCA1 values, and the second column is the PCA2 values. So if I am to say transform column and then zero, I would get all the values of the first component of PCA. How about we create columns to our uh, data set here? So we have our X. Let's create a PCA1 column and PCA2 columns and assign those transform values to them. So here I'm going to be saying X is equal to PCA1 and I'm going to assign to it that transform 0. So this is the PCA1 values. And I need the PCA2 values as well. So here I'm going to be assigning 1. Now if I am to print my X just to see what's going on, you'll see that all the values of PCA1 and all the values of PCA2 were added to that data set. Now let's do some plotting. I'm going to say sns.lm plot. And then we are going to call the, the column PCA1. And then we have the label PCA2. Now. We need the hue. What data should be colored? Well, I want to color the purchased, right? Because this is what I want to classify, actually. We have the purchased. Then we are going to pass the data. So the data is my X here, as false. Let's see. Here we go. As you can see, the data were splitted, actually. And PCA could create two regions here. One of them is for zero, meaning he did not purchase, which are the blue dots, and we have the orange dots. We will see that there is some overlapping, and that's totally fine, because some of the samples we have might not make sense, and they are outliers, as we have defined outliers, being data that just does not fit to our model very perfectly, and that is totally fine. This is also the reason why we got an accuracy of 88% in the first place, because it's not a perfect model. It tries to generalize the problem as much as possible. And by that, we have done some clustering using PCA. And the next algorithm is called linear regression. As the name indicates, we can use this algorithm in order to solve regression problems where we need to predict a value. Okay, it's different from classification. We use this for regression. I'm going to give you an example now. Let's say that we have a feature here, whatever it is, and here we have a label. What I mean by that, here I have data, and here I have an outcome, which we will be using as a prediction later. Let me plot those data points. Let's say that the data points for this problem or for this feature versus outcome looks like this. As you can see, this data looks kind of a linear, right? Now, linear regression is going to try to find the line that fits this data like that. This is the whole purpose of linear regression. But how does it find it? Well, it tries to find the line that minimizes the distance between those points to the line okay this is the whole point we need to minimize this distance as much as possible and then we will be considering that line the correct line now let's say we have found that line how do we do predictions well let's say we got a new feature point right here all we need to do is to project it now to the line we have and go to the outcome to get a value or a prediction. This is all we need to do. It's all based on this line that we have fitted. Now, let me back up a little bit. How does this algorithm try to find this line? Well, it first starts with a horizontal line like this, and then it finds 
what we call the residual. The residual is nothing but the distance. So it calculates the residuals or the distance. Let's say here the distance is 3, 2, 1, 2, 0 0.01, 1, 4. Okay, now what it does is it squares them up, all of them. So this will be squared, this will be squared, this will be squared, 0 0.01 will be squared, the two here or the one here will be squared, and this will be squared. And then it will add them up together in order to get a number. Okay, now we will save this number and we are going to repeat this for a different line. Now we are going to rotate this line a little bit more. So it was horizontal. Now maybe it is looking like this. Then we come here. We measure the residuals or the distance. We square them up and we add them. Then we get a new number. So now we have number one, we have number two, and we keep rotating and doing that. So we have an all up to let's say and 20 we kept rotating this 20 times then what we would do is take the least number this is why it's called least square and that's it this is all you need to do once we find this line we have solved linear regression and we can use it to predict future values Now it's time to implement some linear regression. We are going to be creating some artificial data and try to fit a line into those data. What is the pattern of our data or what should it be? It should be linear because we want to fit linear regression. It makes total sense. The first thing is to import matplotlib because I'm going to be using it for this problem. We can use Seaborn as well, but my choice is matplotlib here as plt. And then I'm going to be importing numpy as mp. And we need to import linear regression from sklearn. So we're going to say from sklearn.linear underscore model import linear regression. Now let us create our data. How do we do that? We have talked about how we create artificial linear data and we're going to repeat the same thing. I'm going to say random number is equal to np.random.random state. Okay. By that, we are creating a random number generator. Now let's create our x points. x is going to equal to, let's say, 20 times rng.rand50. Okay. We are creating 50 points. Now, if I am to print this x, okay, it's rn, not rng. Here we go. We generated data points starting from 0 all the way to 20. We've generated 50 of them. Okay, now let's create our y's. So y here needs to be a linear function. So it's going to be 3 times x plus rn dot ra and dn 50. Okay, now if I am to print y, you'll see that I get these sets of points how about we plot them we're going to say plt dot scatter x and y and here we go those are my points as you can see they are linear and they are not actually super linear and super smooth we have some points going right and left here and there and this is exactly what i want because i want to make a semi-realistic data set now this data set could be maybe the temperature versus how many rotations would a motor rotate. Let's say when the temperature goes up, the rotation should go up all until a certain range. Okay, what is the next step? We need to fit a line into this data. I have explained what happens under the hood with linear regression, but with the sklearn library, we can do that with a few lines. I'm going to say here model is equal to linear regression and we're going to say here fit underscore intercept is equal to true okay we created our model now now it's time to fit this data now, if i just print x you'll see that the data points are stacked like this but what i want is i want a large list and every number is a separate list this is the way how linear regression is expecting my data 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say x is equal to column. And I'm going to add a new axis here from numpies, which is none. So I'm going to say none. And we need to say x here. Now if I am to print x, you'll see that I got them like this. This is the format that uh, linear regression is expecting. Now we can fit the model and we can actually just take this and put it here. Now let's fit the model. We're going to say model.fit and I'm going to be passing x and y. Oh, sorry, the plotting need to be before we do this transformation. <laughs> so let's return this here and we're good. Now we have fitted our line, meaning that we have trained it. Okay, next step is we're going to generate data so that we can test this linear regression model. Now let us create those data that we are going to use to predict. I'm going to call these x test and I'm going to be using the mp line space function. So mp.lin space. And we need the range to be between 0 and 20. And I'm going to divide this into uh, 100 sections. Okay. So as I said, these are the data that are used as my data set, which presumably we have collected them. And here I have the data that I want to predict. And they are skimming a line between 0 and 20 every 0 0.02 a step. Okay. Now, we need to transform this data the same way we did here so that linear regression can accept it. So I'm going to say uh, x test is equal to x underscore test and then we need to pass this and none. And now it's time to create my y which is the prediction. So this is my y prediction or just let's call it y prid. I'm going to be passing those points into my model here and get y prediction okay does this make sense i have new points i want to pass them to my model and see where will they map according to my model so y prediction is going to equal to model dot predict x test and now we need to plot them i'm going to say plt dot plot this time i'm not going to scatter them i just want to draw a line a prediction line and this prediction line is going to have the x test and the y predict here we go let me change the color to red and here we go as you can see we have predicted those values perfectly because this line of prediction is actually passing in between my data so by that we have created linear regression and now we can pass any point and see where does it land on the y-axis. So linear regression is the simplest type of regression actually. Now let's see how we can extract parameters. When we talked about linear regression, we said that the most important two parameters are the slope and the y-interception point. And we can actually extract these two parameters from my model right here. Let's see how we can do that. I'm going to be printing here, print slope. We are going to say here model.coefficient like that and then pass zero. As you can see, this is the slope of my equation. If you remember, a line equation is equal to y equals mx plus b the slope is the m and b is the y interception point now let's get the y interception point so print intercept where is my intercept we need to say model dot intercept underscore like this and this is my interception point so right now we can draw this line anywhere because well we already have the equation we already have the equation equaling y equals mx plus b. And we can use it anywhere we want in order to perform predictions for this particular problem. The next algorithm we are going to talk about is actually the polynomial regression. Before, we have talked about linear regression. And linear regression was all about fitting a line into our data. 
So we had a line like this. We just had data points like that. And what we did is fitting a line like this into it. All right. And we used this line to make future predictions. Well, how about if my data looks different? Let's say that my data looks like this. Now, if I try to fit a line here, as you can see, there is some issues because here the data is not being fitted well. So a simple linear line of the equation y equals mx plus p, b being the intercept with y and m being the slope, is not enough. What we need is a higher order equation, something like y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. If I have such an equation, maybe I could fit a parabola or a curved line like this. Right? This would represent my data way better. But right now, the challenge is to find not only two parameters, but multiple parameters. So we need to find A, B, and C. But wait, we said that linear regression actually only works with linear data. And that's correct, because we are still working with linear data, because we are working with A, B, C, which are linear values. We are not working with the X squared or the X. The Xs here are nothing but the features we have. Okay? So this is like square of the feature. But the unknown parameters will be A, B, C. Same thing here, where we had the unknown parameters being M and B. Now we have more unknown parameters to find out. And that's the only difference between a polynomial regression and a linear regression. Now, polynomial regression can have even higher orders. The more complex our data is, the higher order of equation I might require. So polynomial regression might use something like a third order polynomial. So here we would be having ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus b. And this will yield a more complex line. And this could go all the way up to n. So this order here can go as high as we want. And all we need to do is just to find the constants that are multiplied by our feature. Now let's implement some polynomial regression. All right, so let us implement some polynomial regression. First, I'm going to be importing NumPy. And I'm going to import the following function, which is called from scilearn.preprocessing import polynomial features. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be plotting a sine function. And we are going to predict the sine of a number using polynomial regression. But first, Let's try fitting linear regression into our sign data. Let's create a random generator number. We are going to say mp.random.random state. And next we need to create the x point. So x is going to equal to rng.rand50. Let's say we have 50 points. Now we are going to be generating numbers between 0 and 1. And as you can see here, we have generated all of this data. All right, that's the first step. Now, let us plot our y. So y is going to equal to mp.sign x. And I'm going to be adding some shifting to this x, which is equal to plus maybe 0 0.1 times rn dot random 50. Now, let us show y. Now, also y is having a certain range. Let us plot our data. I'm going to say here plt.scatter. What do I want to scatter? x, y, and color equals red. Uh, yeah, we need to import uh, matplotlib. So we'll say here import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And we are plotting the data. Now, currently, this is not really visible that we are uh, plotting a whole sine wave. Now, if we multiply this by 10, 
you'll see that now this looks a little bit more as a sine data, right? The data is increasing, decreasing, increasing again. So maybe this is kind of a cyclic function with some noise around it. All right. It could be uh, representing maybe a pendulum position that is swinging to both ends without losing energy. OK, it could be anything, actually. How about we create data to predict? As usual, we will be creating uh, data to test and we will use the lens space from 0 to 10 and the step is 100. Now we are going to call linear regression. So I'm going to call here model is equal to linear regression. Then we'll say model.fit. Remember that we need to change the shape of our data. Of course, we need to pass the x data. We did not fit it yet. So maybe this x test can be postponed a little bit. So let us reshape this data. We're going to say x is equal to x, then column, and then on. Okay. This will reshape our data. And we need to fit x and y, right? Now, if I am running this, we got an error. Linear regression is not defined because we need to import linear regression. So from sklearn.linear underscore model import linear regression. Let's try again. And we did the fit. Now let's do some prediction. Now that we have trained our model using the X and Y here, the features and the labels, now we can do some prediction on this data that we have generated for testing purposes. So I'm going to say Y predict. I'm going to be predicting the X test using my model. So I'm going to say model dot predict. And also we need to change the shape of X test. So X test is equal to X test column and none. Now let's predict X test. Here we go. We did the prediction. Now let's plot it. So I'm going to say here plt dot plot. We need the X test. And we also need the X Y prediction. Now, if we run this, we will get a linear regression line that is trying its best to fit. But a line cannot be curved, actually, because linear regression is only about a line with the equation mx plus b initially, because we did not apply any polynomial regression to it. So right now, we see that linear regression failed entirely in replicating the data. So let's try polynomial regression. All right, so right now, we are going to start implementing polynomial regression instead of fitting this into a linear regression. So I'm going to be commenting out everything related to linear regression at the moment. So we have this one. Sorry. No. We have this one, this one, this line, this line, and this line, and this line. <laughs> Almost everything. OK. How are we going to fit a polynomial here? I'm going to create a variable that is called poly. And I'm going to be calling an sklearn function called polynomial features. Let's pass a function of the seventh degree, for example. OK. And I'm going to set include underscore bias to false. OK. Now, what will this do? What does this function do? I'm going to show you exactly what it does. Let's say that I am predicting the weight of a person with regard to how many calories he eats per day. OK, so here I have the number of calories and here I have the weight that I am trying to predict. All right. And I have entries one all the way to 1000 or whatever. Now, as we know, we've talked about this a lot. The number of calories is the feature. And the weight is nothing but the label, right? Now, polynomial, that function that I showed you is going to generate a function based on the power you give it to it. So I said here polynomial of the power 7. Well, it is going to take this feature, okay? Let's call this feature now x. And it's going to convert it to the following form. It's going to say 
ax to the power 7 plus bx to the power 6 plus cx to the power 5 plus dx to the power 4 and this will continue e f g until we reach g times x plus h all right so what it did is it took this feature and it did add it to the power of seven then it took the same feature and made it to the power of six five four all the way to one to the feature itself and then it generated some parameters to find using linear regression which are the a b c d g h see what does this polynomial uh, function do it takes your feature it makes it to the power something and then it multiplies it by those hyperparameters which we will be finding when we fit our model it's a really powerful function in scalar now this is what we have done here this will return the polynomial of power 7 to me and now we are going to call fit and transform respectively since there is some transformation going on since we have powers here but we can merge these as follows we can say here poly is equal to poly dot fit underscore transform so this function will do fitting and transforming at the same time two in one step and then we need to pass x to it all right so now we are fitting and transforming our data into this seventh degree polynomial now how are we going to continue we will continue the same way we were doing linear regression we will create a model for linear regression and then we will fit it with the polynomial here and y so actually let me change the name here to x so that i know that this is my new data right now and then i'm going to be fitting this new x data that is transformed to the seventh power and the same y that we have okay that's great now we are going to continue as usual we will have multiple points and we are going to predict them and we are going to reshape the x test we are going to do the prediction and then finally we will be plotting everything now if we execute this okay now here we have a problem with the include bias we have a typo let's try again we will get another error and i will tell you why we got this another error here we are taking our data reshaping it and converting it into a polynomial so whenever we have a new data to test we need to follow the same steps now we have the new data we are reshaping it but we are not converting it yet to a polynomial so i'm going to take these two lines and we are putting them here so we are creating a new polynomial now and this data will be my x test and I'm going to be transforming my X test. See what we've done here? We have a new data, reshape it, convert it to a polynomial so that the model can accept it because the model was trained that the data looks like this, which is like a polynomial. So whenever you have a new data, you need to redo the same pre-processing. Okay, and now we want to predict this X large test and we want to plot our normal test data, right? When I am plotting, I don't want to plot this high polynomial function. I just want to plot my regular points on the graph. Now, if I run this, here we go. As you can see, we got a smooth line trying to follow our data perfectly. So our signed function predictor is just doing great right now on new data. ready for a new algorithm now we are going to talk about k-means clustering which is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm let's say that we have a data set and this data set can be obtained in two ways one it was projected from the high dimensional data set meaning that maybe we had 10 features and maybe we used pca let's say for example or any other algorithm to reduce the dimensions into only two dimensions. And we ended up with something like this. And then we would like to do clustering on this data set. Two, the data set could be actually two dimensional, meaning we have only two features and their distribution looks like this. And I would like to see the relationship between them. 
Okay, so let's say in either way we ended up having two axes and I would like to cluster these data together. Now, visually, this is very easy. I can simply just look at them and see that we have three clusters. Now, the first step is to determine how many clusters do I have. There is fancy ways to choose the number of clusters, but in some cases, we already know that we would like to categorize our, let's say, data in two, three, four, or five groups. Okay, so right now, I'm going to be assuming that we have three clusters. How does this algorithm find these three clusters on its own without looking at them visually because the model could be way more complex than that? Initially, we choose endpoints equaling to the number of clusters. So here we set three clusters, meaning that I'm going to be choosing three random points. So the first point may be here. It's going to be green. The second point could be uh let's say yellow and maybe it was allocated here randomly and the third point could have been allocated let's say here initially okay so we choose three random points so one choose random points okay what is the next step well we need to measure all the other points distance to those cluster points how would I do that? Well, let's take the first point. This is my first point. Now we need to measure only the blue points distance to those yellow, red, and green. So this is the first one. We measure the distance. We measure the distance to this, and we measure the distance to this. We take the shortest distance, and we include this point to that cluster. Who is the shortest distance? Well, it is shortest distance to the yellow. So what would I do is... I would simply make this point yellow. Okay, next point. We have now this blue point down here. We are going to measure it to this and measure its distance to this and measure its distance to this, right? Let me just mark the cluster points so that we don't confuse them. We have these are the cluster points right now. All right, so we have measured the three points here and the shortest one is actually to the green one. So, it's okay, let me do that. All right, now it is a green point. Let me remark the clusters. We have one, two, and this is the third cluster. Okay, now let us continue. Let's take these points right now. Let's take, for example, this point here. We will be measuring it to this point, to this point, and to this point. And we would see that it's the closest to this point right here. This means that this point now is red, right? Because it's closest to the red. Now we will continue. What about this point right here? Well, this point seems like it's closer to the green than the red. So we will label it green. And the last point here is also seems to be closer to the green. So it will also be green. Now, as you can see, this is a very, very bad clustering for now right i mean this is not even close to the reality what happens is after we measure the distances we will calculate the mean point for every color so we calculate the mean point where is the middle point in each one so for example let's take the green ones where is the mean points located well it seems that the mean point the middle point maybe is still the same point the green one so we will leave it as the next cluster take a look at the red well the mean point in between could be either of them actually and this why we will be assigning it randomly and let's say it was assigned here this time so this will be my new point all right and finally take a look at the yellow as well it doesn't matter so we'll just leave it as it is and now starts the next iteration we can see that this point here should stay green because it's closest to the green now, these two points here now are closer to the red one. It means that they will be red right now. So as you can see, they are labeled red now. Now take a look at this cluster. Now we have this point and this point, and they are closer to the yellow point. It means that now this one is actually yellow and this one is yellow. Now we can see by repeating this mean calculation and recalculating the distances, we will converge to find the clusters.
Well, how does the algorithm know when to stop? Well, we'll keep repeating this until we see that we are not shifting the centers of the clusters anymore. So when we keep repeating this by three, calculate distance, and four, check if centers are changing. Once we don't see this anymore, we will say that it's stabilized and that we have found the clusters, right? Because if we repeat this now, we will be choosing the mean, which is the center of the clusters, and it will be again this one, it will be again this one, and it will be again this one. And we will be repeating ourselves without shifting the centers. And by that, we know that we have converged and reached the final state. All right, now we are ready to start some clustering programming. As usual, Scalar library has these functions that can do everything for k-means, and we are going to utilize them, actually. First, we need some data. The data we are going to get is an artificial data that we will use to demonstrate this algorithm. Do you remember how we create artificial data? It was very simple. We used the sample generation from the sklearn dataset library. We also have numpy and we have this cool k-means function from sklearn. Let's get started by first creating some artificial data. I'm gonna pass here x and y and they will equal to make underscore blobs which we have talked about when we were talking about data in general and how we can generate artificial data. So we have make blobs and we have n underscore samples is equal to, let's say, 300 samples. Let's create four centers here. So centers equals four. I'm going to be creating some standard deviations. So cluster underscore STD could equal to something like, I don't know, 0 0.69 or 7. Doesn't matter. And that's it. Now let's take a look how does the X look like. It contains two components here, as we can see, and we have three hundreds of them. These two components are the x and the y coordinates. Let's plot this. I'm going to say plt dot scatter, and I'm going to be passing x. Let's pass only the x coordinates, and we need the y coordinates here, so it's going to be here. The y coordinates like that. Well, let's plot it. Here we go. As you can see, we have four clusters all colored together. I think the number of clusters is too much. Uh, let me reduce this to maybe around 100. Okay, this looks a little bit better. We can also increase the size of these dots. So I'm going to say here S is equal to, let's say, 40 maybe. Okay, 40 is not really much bigger. So 60. Yeah, 60 is good. All right, so this is my clusters right now. We have four of them. What's next is to start the k-means. This is our data. And as I said, this data could be projected from higher dimensional algorithm like PCA or TSNE, which we will see later, maybe isomaps. We have a lot of dimensionality reduction algorithms, or it could be actually just a simple two feature graph here maybe we are just plotting the weight versus the tail length of a rat okay and the data looks like this so this could be anything let us now start doing some k-means i'm gonna say here model is equal to k-means and let's determine the number of clusters to four so i'm going to say n clusters equal to four as simple as that uh, there is no n here and clusters equals to four. Okay, now it's time to fit. As usual, we say model.fit, we pass the features, right? I'm not sure why I am typing everything here. This makes no sense. So let me write in a new cell here. Okay, now let us do some predictions. I'm gonna say here, why predict? And these predictions are going to be as follows. 
y predict is equal to model dot predict. We're not gonna generate new data. I just wanna see what is the performance on my same data. So I'm gonna pass x one more time. Usually when we have a data set, we separate these into training and testing. But since I just wanna see the colors in, on this map, it's fine to just pass the same data. I'm not trying to predict anything new, at least in this scenario. Now let's do some plotting again. So I'm going to say plt.scatter. This time the plotting is going to be for my predicted values, right? So here we have, we will pass the x and y axes from the same as here, right? Because this is just the coordinates. And then why am I bringing those? Because y predict is actually using the x coordinates, right? So if I had x test, I would pass x test here. But since I'm predicting the same thing that I trained with, I'm just passing the same coordinates because this is all I have. So C is equal to Y underscore predict. We need to pass this size. Let's say it's 50. And that's it. Let me plot this. Again, one more typo. Predict. Here we go. As you can see now, we are coloring all of our data because Y predict did predict that. If you want to see the output of Y predict, let me just show you the output really quickly. Now the output here is nothing but groups, okay? And here we passed C equal Y predict because C is the color. So right here for every data, I'm giving it a numerical color, okay? This is why we passed Y predict here. So Y predict returns the group we have and they are now colored. How about we draw the centers? of our clusters. Remember the most important thing in that algorithm was how it finds the clusters centers. And then it changes the centers by calculating the mean again, calculating the distances one more time, and then choosing new centers. So as we have explained in the video where we talked about k-mean clustering intuition. So let me remove this and draw the centers. But how do we draw centers? It's very easy. We'll just say centers is equal to model dot cluster underscore centers underscore. Now all we need to do is to just plot this. I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna say these are my centers now. This is the x-axis and this is the y-axis of my centers. And I would like them to be with the color, I don't know, red maybe because we don't have red in the map. And the sizes will be a little bit bigger so that we can distinguish them. Let's say maybe something like 100. And as you can see now, we have found the centers. And the centers are exactly in the middle of our clusters. So this is how we perform clustering. It's really not that hard. All we need to do is just make use of sklearn, determine how many clusters do we need, and just compile them together and run them. And by that, we can take a higher dimensional data or two features data and just cluster them. Now let me show you how we can get data that contains multiple features, shrink it down into two dimensions and then simply use clustering in order to cluster it. So this would be a very very practical application where you will see it anywhere if you are working in data science. Here is what we need to do. First I'm going to be importing uh, Seaborn. So import Seaborn as SNS and we need to import pandas as PD. Now let us get a data set. The data I'm going to use is the iris data set from SNS. So SNS.load underscore data set iris and we have seen this data set before it actually contains three kinds of flowers each with different measurements for its petals so let me show you this data set one more time if you have forgot it already so here it contains the species the petal width petal length sepal width and the sepal length and here we have three species actually okay first step let's apply pca here that would be really good but we need to import it so i'm going to import it here from sklearn.decomposition import pca okay now we are going to start let's do this here i'm going to say model is equal to pca n 
underscore component is equal to one. Uh, sorry, is equal to two. We have two principal components. Okay. Next, we need to fit. So model dot fit. What are we going to fit here? Well, let me show you. First, I cannot really fit the data as it is because it contains a string. So I need to do one more step before I go to fit. It's saying here x is equal to pd.get underscore dummies. We all remember this function where we will be encoding these strings and we need to pass data to it and just print x.head. And you'll see that we have encoded this into multiple columns right now. The display here is not really that good because we need to pass the parentheses. <laughs> okay. Now we have encoded this. Great. Now let's do the fitting on the data. Next, after fitting, of course, we need to do the transform. So I'm going to say here, PCA underscore transform is equal to model dot transform X. Now we are going to add two new columns as usual. We have talked about this before. So we need to add two more columns for the X axis and the Y axis. So here we will say X PCA one is equal to uh, pca underscore transform and then we need to pass only the x coordinates right this is how we pass it this is the x coordinates and we need the y coordinates as well so this will be my pca2 and this will be my y coordinates here now we did the division of x's and y's now let's plot cns.lm plot and we need to pass here the labels we have pca1 and we have pca2 and then we have our data which is x and we need to say fit regression equals false and let's plot this you will see that we have our data we had all of these features so how many dimensions is this dimension two three four five six we had seven dimensions and we compressed them into only two dimensions and we still maintained the information right here. And we can see that visually at least we can cluster them. Now let's do the real clustering. I'm going to go and copy these as they are because I don't want to rewrite them again. We just did that uh, one lecture ago. So if you do this. How many clusters do we need here? We need only three clusters. We will be fitting instead of X here. We need to fit different data, right? What data do I want to fit? Of course, it is this PCA transform, right? Because where is my new X's and Y's? It's inside here. So this is what I want to fit. I want to predict and we want to display here. And we will be passing the colors from the Y prediction here. Then we need to draw the centers and let's compile. And here we go. This is our graph. Now it is colored. We calculated the centers and we created three clusters. This is amazing. Right now we actually have a clustering algorithm. And we can visualize high order data shrink it down and just cluster it and that's really great as usual it's very important to predict new data so we are going to learn how we can predict new data with k-mean clustering the method is not different from any method you need to understand how you are feeding your data to your model and then replicate that for new data okay so right now what are we doing exactly before we do that we have a data frame right here we are converting it into this pca transformation in order to reduce dimension or the number of features into two principal models right and then what we are doing is we are feeding that into our prediction so we have multiple steps here so the first one was to create a data frame what I'm going to do right now is to pass this value and see if the prediction is going to be accurate. All right, so let's do that. The values are 5.1, 3.5, 1.4, 0.2, 1. And even though we have seven features, I'm going to be passing two more. Why? Because here we are adding the PCA components to our data set. 
if we want we can from the beginning not even do that and just don't do this step and find another way but since we already did it we need to account for it now our feature contains as you can see where here you can see that these are the features and we have the pca1 and pca2 calculated values so initially those will be zero next we need to create the data frame and I'm going to create it the long way so that you can see this step by step. So first we're going to say uh, data test is equal to PD dot data frame. And then I'm going to say columns is equal to W, which is my new data there. Now, if I print data test, we will be getting these values. All right. Now, those values are just column names. It could be anything. It really doesn't matter what your column names are. So this is just an easy way to do it. Now we're going to say dataset is equal to dataset dot append, and then we are going to pass a series. So we have pd dot series. This is the easiest way also to do that. So, and we need to pass the column names and the values we want to append. Since the column name, which is this one, is the same thing as the value I'm going to append. So all I'm going to say is s dot columns. And then I'm going to be saying index is equal to s dot columns, which are the row values. Okay. Next, we need just to say ignore index is equal to true. Now, if I just print my data test, uh, data test is not defined where. Sorry, data test here as well, and here as well. Okay, so right now we have this data frame and it's ready to be fed into the PCA. Now there is something that I would like to do here. If we go back to the PCA, you will notice that I used the name model to create this PCA transformation. Now what I want to do is I'm going to use the same transformation, the same PCA transformation I used here in order to transform my new data. And since I called it model here, and I called the, and I also used the same name for my k-means, which is also model, this did override this already. So I need to change this to model PCA so that I can have the uh, k-mean clustering model and the model PCA model. Okay. I need both of them for this transformation. So this will be PCA, this will be PCA. Let me recompile this, so I have this one, this one, this one, and again, this one, okay? Now we are ready to feed this into our transformer. I'm going to say here, test transform is equal to PCA model, the one that we just renamed, okay? I'm going to be using this transformation, and I'm going to do the transformation now. I'm going to say dot transform now why am i using the same model why am i not creating a new uh, pca model well it makes no sense to create a pca model because it is already here it memorized how the reduction of features is being done right so i need the same way i have reduced my features on my data set i would like to do it on my new data so it's very very important that you use the same pca model in order to do this transformation so right here we are going to say data test let us replace these two zeros right here how do i replace them well we are going to say data test then say pca1 just the same way we did there is equal to test transform and now we, we will be getting the x and y data from our pca so this is my x and of course i need my second pca component so this is my y now it's time to do some prediction we're going to say model dot predict test transform again take a look here we said model predict pca transform right we are just replicating the same steps for our new data and we're good as you can see the prediction said that we are in group zero which makes sense now let me show you if I say plt.scatter, let me plot this data. So I can just simply copy this and just paste it here. This is for my old data. Now I need to plot the new data, okay? The new data 
is residing in test transform. So I'm going to replace this with test transform. This one as well. And I'm going to make the size 200 so that it is visible and the color is going to be orange. Now, as you can see, it plotted the data just where it is supposed to be. And that's really, really great. So this is group zero. And you can replace these values, except for these two zeros, with any value you want in order to predict future values. And a new algorithm is on the way, which is SVM or Support Vector Machine. Support Vector Machine is a very famous classification algorithm, and it is considered a supervised machine learning algorithm. Let me give you a very simple example to see how does this work. Let's assume that we have one axis that is representing my data and my label meaning that on this axis, I would like to do classification. Let's say that this axis represents number of time a person clicked on a website when he was in the website. And here you can think about it as a scale, let's say from one all the way to 100. And we are going to classify if this person purchased something depending on how many times he clicked, okay? So let's say that we have samples on this side, like this, indicating that the user did not purchase anything. And I have samples over here that is indicating that this user did purchase something when he clicked too much in the website. Now let's create a divider that will divide these two classes. Let's say that the divider here, okay? So since this is only one dimensional, in order to divide these into two classes, I need just a one-dimensional, maybe threshold, right? So this is my threshold. Now, let's say that I got new data right here. It will be classified simply as user did not purchase. Now, let's say that I got another one here. Well, we are above the threshold, and it makes sense. However, assume that I got a sample just right here. Well, if the sample is right here, I'm going to be considering it as the user did purchase something. And this is not entirely true because this point is so close to when the user did not purchase anything. So this threshold does not perform well when the points are too close to it because, well, sometimes like in this scenario, it will yield a wrong classification. Okay, so this is scenario one. Well, the next solution is to use what is called maximal margin classifier. Now, what is a maximal margin classifier? We choose a place to place this threshold just in the middle of our latest observation, right? So the distance here, or we call it margin, is equal to the distance here, which we also call margin. Okay, this is why it's called maximal margin classifier, because it's take the maximum amount of distance that we can take from the observations. Because here, if we just move it a little bit to the right, this margin will be smaller, and it can actually be more than that. So it does not satisfy the maximal margin classifier. This is why we need that point to be just in the middle. This is the right place to it. Well, but there is also weaknesses to this technique. Now, we said that the maximal margin classifier did well, but how about if my distribution looks something like this? So I have a red point near my green points, okay? Meaning that a user clicked this many times, but he did not actually purchase. Well, if I am to draw that margin for the maximal margin classifier, it's going to be right here. And the margins will be too small and they are almost attached to the green observations, meaning that the user purchased something. It means that if I get a new observation and I just put it here, 
this will be also misclassified because most probably this is just an outlier and here I am having a data point that should belong to the right hand side. Well, then the maximal margin will not be doing well because this point now will be classified as red, meaning that no purchase. And that's wrong. And the solution to that is what we call soft margins. A soft margin will be placed just in between these two, as we have said, and it is going to tolerate that there is a mislabel here. It knows that there is a mislabel here and it will tolerate it because for the long run, we know that if we get a new observation here, it will be most probably a green one. And we know that this is nothing but an outlier. And this is what a soft margin is, which we will hear quite a bit. Now, let us get into a more complex problem. Let's say that now we have two axes and the data is distributed like that. Again, the same thing I told you when we were talking about k-mean clustering. Here we have two scenarios that we got this data. Either we have feature 1 versus feature 2 being plotted like that, like weight versus height. Or this data, we obtained it by reducing, reducing the dimensionality of a certain data using PCA or other algorithms. It means that I had features from 1 to 10, for example, and I shrink them down to two features just using PCA algorithm, which yields a graph that looks like this. So PCA is a key in the second scenario, or it could be something else which we will be talking about later. Okay, back to the problem. What we need to do here is to draw the border and the marginal line. Here would be my line that divides the two classes. And then I have my soft margins, which within them I would allow misclassifications. So right now here and here, I am going to allow misclassification in all of this area. Okay, when I am training my data. Because I know in the future when I am predicting, I'm going to be getting more greens here than I will be getting red. So I know that the classification will be more accurate in the long run. And this is what PCA is about. And this is what linear support vector machine is actually. Now there are other scenarios where we cannot fit a straight line like this. Let me give you an example. Now, when we have something like this, we're going to need something more than a straight line, because no matter what straight line I try to find, I won't be able to separate this data, right? Do it like this, you do it like this, always there will be a huge mess and a misclassification. So what we need here is an SVM, but a kernel based one. So it would create a border that looks something like this. And of course, it's going to add to it a soft margin. Not sure if I can draw this well. Let's take a look. Yes, here and here. These are my soft margins. We have been talking about the soft margins and I'm going to give you the term for them, which is actually support vectors. So those are nothing but support vectors. Until this moment, we did not talk about support vector machines, which we are going to talk about in the following example. Let's assume that this is my data set. And right here, this is measuring that if I have a cup of milk and I want to add chocolate to it in grams, what is the perfect amount that will make this delicious? Okay, so this is my milk and I'm going to be pouring chocolate per grams. All right. So, for example, if I am to pour, let's say here it's 20 grams, well, it will taste bad. 
but there is this area right here that it would taste perfect maybe in around 50 grams and after that if i add it too much it's going to also taste bad if we try to draw a support vector machine no matter where we draw it we won't be able to make predictions take a look if i draw it here well the greens are here and the reds are here and if i draw it here it will also make me problems so a support vector machine will not work this is like a simplified problem of this problem right here where if we try to draw a line we cannot really split this data no matter how we draw the line so here we are taking a very simplified example to show you what is the solution to this the solution to this is to do the following we will be adding a new axis and this will be the gram square for every point so let's say here we are starting at one gram all the way let's say to 100 grams and we will be squaring all of this data so if we square this number we will be getting a pattern that looks like this because this is just squaring right and squaring ramps up like that now what we did here we moved this one dimension into two dimensions it means that we moved the data into a higher dimension now what is the use of moving all of this to a higher dimension now we can draw a support vector actually take a look if we draw a line like that we will see that we now are able to draw that line see what happened here here we were unable to draw a line in one dimension but once we increased the dimensions and moved our data into a higher dimension we are now able to do that we are now able to draw the support vector and this is what we call a support vector machine this whole moving to a higher dimension and drawing the support vector now what we have used here we have used something called the polynomial kernel because we were able to move these to a higher dimension by using some kind of higher polynomial now let's assume that we have two dimensional data we would move it to three dimensions right now we had only one dimension of data and we moved it to two now if we have two we would move it to three so for example this is what happened here in order to solve it we have drawn a third axis let's say and we mapped all of those in order to draw a hyperplane so we draw a 3d plane that can split this data but let's say that we are going into four or five or six dimensions because we have four five or six features then we won't be able to illustrate it but we can still apply the same math of the kernel now everything happened here is actually mathematical and there is operations for that and they don't really care how many dimensions we have and we can just apply it for any dimension what you are going to do right now is to start working with the minced data set now the minced data set is a very famous data set that contains images of handwritten digits from 0 to 9 and the applications there is that we can pass any handwritten digit and this system can recognize what is the number even though that this number is not actually a text number that is digitalized it's only an image of a handwritten digit converted into digitalized image and then it is being added to this data set let's load this data set and see what does it have inside first i'm going to be importing matplotlib and second we need to import from sklearn import datasets so this times the datasets won't come from our seaborn library but they will come from the sklearn library i'm going to define a variable and i'm going to call it digits it will equal to datasets dot load underscore digits okay now let's see what does this digits contain so if i print digits you'll see that it contains a lot of data 
Let's see it in a more organized way. Let's print the keys of this dictionary since digits now is a dictionary returned from this library. Okay, we have data, target, frame, feature names, target names, images, and DESCR. It actually contains a lot of stuff. How about we take a look at the images? We can use OpenCV or we can use matplotlib in order to show all of these images. All right, so let's show this image using matplotlib. All we need to do is just say plt.imageShow, okay? And we need to pass the image. Where is the image? It is in digits initially. And the key to the images is this key. And we need to pass the first image, okay? If I hit run, you'll see that this is digit zero, actually. It is a little bit off color. So maybe we can fix the colors a bit. So here, if I say cmap is equal to plt.cm.gray underscore r, you'll see that now I have my image as a gray scale. So this parameter here is going to display the images as a gray scale. That's nice. This is a zero. Now, if I pass one you'll see that i have one two this is two i know the resolution is not the best but the minced has compressed images here so this is four let's create a loop to show all of these i just wanted to show you the easiest way to show images now let's make it a little bit more complex so i'm gonna leave this here and i'm gonna say four ax image label in zip what do we want to zip? Access. Then we have digits dot images. Then we have digits dot target. Now what am I doing here? Remember the zip keyword extracts the first element of each of those and creates something like a tuple out of them. Okay, it's extract element one from here, from here, from here, and then and just pass them to those variables here. And this is great because I have multiple axes, I have multiple images, and I have multiple targets. Now the target is just the label. So the target of image four right here is nothing but a string of four. Now, let's continue. We have extracted the first element, second, third, fourth of all of those. Now let us do something. First, we did not define axes yet. So let's define axes. I forgot to do that, so figure axis is equal to plt.sub plots we have number of rows i would like to display everything in one row and i would like to display everything in 10 columns why 10 columns because i have the digits from 0 to 9 which yields 10 elements next we have the figure size i don't know let's make it something like 10 by 3 initially and we'll see if we need to adjust it later Okay, so this is my figures and axes. Figures and axes and subplots allows me to create multiple images next to each other in matplotlib. All right, let's show those images. I'm going to say ax, the ax that I have zipped or extracted from these axes, dot image show. So maybe I can just take this one and modify it, right? So here I'm going to say ax dot image show. Okay. I would like to display the image. It is being extracted to this variable from here, right? We are taking them one by one. I'm going to leave this as grayscale. And also, I would like to add the label. So I'm going to say ax.setTitle is going to equal to string converting to string label. Label is being taken from these digit targets. Okay. Now, if I run this, we will have an error. Yes, this one has no M. And here we go. As you can see now, I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all up to 9. But I don't want to really show these axes around here. I don't really want to show the X axis numeration and the Y axis. So we can turn those off by simply coming here before image show maybe, and just say ax.set underscore axis underscore off. 
Okay, we are turning off all of those. And as you can see now, we have displayed all the images with the labels coming with them. So this data set is really great. It comes with the images, with the labels of each of them. It even comes with the digits converted into a flat array, which is very useful if we would like to process these images. So this is really great. What we are going to do right now is start implementing some support vector machine. Note, I have added this SVM to the import here, and I also added the model selection for training and testing splitting. So let's code some SVM. What we are going to do is we need support vector machine to classify those images into their correct label. Okay, so I will have an algorithm that can sort out images for me and predict what is the label for this image. If I give it, let's say, image of number five, it should give me a label of five. Now, I want to introduce a small concept. When we are passing images to our SVM, we cannot really pass them as a square array like this. This is not okay. What we want to do is we want to pass the flattened image of this. All right. It means that and instead of being a square, all the images will be just one flat line of an array. Let me show you. If I say here, digit dot images, let's say image zero, you'll see that I have an array of every row. So my images are eight by eight pixels, okay? And they are grayscale. So every pixel is sweeping a value between zero and 255, all right? However, this format does not work. What I would like to have is put all the rows together until I have one very, very large row. Fortunately, we don't have to do this pre-processing with minced because it already contains this way of formatting. If I say digits data zero, this will give me access to the first image, but all the rows are flattened next to each other. So I have only one large array of one row, okay? So this is the format that we can pass to SVM. Okay, let's cut into the chase now. I'm gonna say X is equal to digit dot data. So this is my features. And now I would like to create my model. So my model here is going to be SVM dot SVC. So this is how we create a support vector machine. Next, we need to do the X train X test, Y train Y test. Splitting, we have done this a million times throughout this course, so let's do it quickly. X test y train, then we have y test is equal to train underscore test underscore split. And I would like to pass the x. What is my y? My y is my target, so let's say y is equal to digit dot target. Again, I'm gonna show you quickly what is targets if I say digits dot target you'll see that it contains the labels of every image okay so for example if i say pass target zero you'll see that the label is zero which corresponds to the first image in this dictionary which is also a zero okay so my y here is those labels all right let's continue we will pass y here for my labels Next, we need the test size. So the test size is actually 0.2. 20% of the data will be used for testing. And that's it. Now let's go and fit this model. I'm going to say model.fit. I'm going to be passing, of course, exit train and y train. Next, we will do the predictions. So y predict or y print is equal to model dot predict what we would like to predict is of course our x test we would like to predict our test set and let's print those predictions just for the sake of seeing the output we all see that we predicted the labels of all the images in x test now it's time to evaluate this model Let's do some visual evaluation of our model, okay? We will be using the accuracy score later with confusion matrices, but for now, I just want to evaluate it visually, meaning I would like to show the image and show the predicted label to see if they are matching or not. How can we do that? Well, 
We are going to copy those plotting lines right here using matplotlib and well instead of digits images I would like to pass x uh, test because the x test images that we have predicted here right and as a target I would like to print the predicted labels right so I passed images from this test and I predicted them and I got new labels. Let's see if those new labels predicted are correct or not. So here I'm going to be passing Y train. But there is a catch here. Right now X test is flattened out, right? Because the data we have taken right here is not the image but the flattened version of the image. Remember that one row of image? This is what we have. Fortunately, we can reshape it to 8 by 8 pixels image by using the numpy function, which is called reshape. So very simply, very easily, I'm going to say here, image is equal to image dot reshape to 8 by 8. So here I'm extracting the images from this X test, storing them in this image. And now I am reshaping this image to be an 8 by 8 pixels. Before we continue, this should be why predict. Sorry about that, because we are we have predicted the values and we have stored them actually in y predict. So the labels are the predicted labels, and here we are passing the images, which is the x test. All right, now let's run this. Here we go. Six predicted as six, seven as seven, two, two, nine, nine, zero, zero. We're good actually. The predictions are pretty accurate. Let me pass maybe 20 images. Let's take a look. 4097054. Well, the accuracy is pretty good with support vector machine. Okay. Next, we are going to use accuracy score and confusion matrices. How about we evaluate the accuracy score? We have done this multiple times using multiple algorithms and the method will never change. How do we do that? We import from sklearn, metrics, accuracy score, and we just call accuracy score. We pass the y test versus the y we predicted, the actual labels versus the predicted labels. y print actually it's called, and we got an accuracy of 98%. Now let's see where did our algorithm go wrong mostly. And we do that with confusion matrices. I'm going to say here from sklearn.metrics import confusion underscore matrix. And I'm going to be importing Seaborn as SNS. Okay, first let's create the confusion matrix. CM for confusion matrix is equal to confusion underscore matrix. And then we need to pass our Y test and also our Y prediction, right? It's the same as the accuracy score, but we want to see the details of where did it go wrong. Next, let's call SNS heat map in order to draw the heat map. We are going to pass CM. Annotation is equal to true. We don't want any C bars, so this is false. All right, and now we are good. Let's plot this. And here we go. We have all the labels from 0 to 9 and from 0 to 9, but I don't know which axis is actually the one with two labels and the one with the prediction. So I'm going to say here plt dot x label, and then I'm going to be passing true labels because this is the first element true here. And then we have predicted for the y, so I'm going to say plt dot y label, and then I'm going to be passing predicted. So let's run this. Here we go. This is the true values and those are the predicted. Let's see where did we go wrong here. We have a data here that it was 5 but was predicted as 9. Okay. We also have one value of 7 that was predicted as 9. It could be a bad hand written that it actually looked like 9. This happens even when you are writing your own. Sometimes we may make mistakes because the handwritten is not so clear. Uh, next, we have the 9 was confused with the 7 ones, with the 5 ones. The 8 was doing pretty good. If you go up and look, 8 was 9, 7, 5, 6, all the way up to 0. It's good. As we said, the 7 made a mistake with the 9. 
the 6 was predicted pretty good, the 5 as well, the 4, the 3 was mislabeled as we said, the 2 was mislabeled with the 3 ones, and the 1 with the 8 ones, but yeah, eventually we are doing some really good predictions with 98%. That's great. A new algorithm is on the horizon, which is called Linear Discriminant Analysis, or we can call it LDA. LDA is similar to BCA, and there is few differences. LDA is actually a supervised learning algorithm, and BCA is unsupervised, as we have seen before. So, what is LDA exactly? It is also used to reduce dimensionality. When we have a lot of features, like feature 1 all the way to feature 10, we can reduce those to two axes, axis 1 and axis 2, and we can represent all of our data just using two axes instead of 10, which is not doable in reality. Well, let's see how LDA works in short, just to get an intuition on how things go. Let's assume that I have data that looks like this, and I would like to separate it into two groups. Since we are reducing dimensionality, LDA is going to try to project all of this data into one axis, for example. So let's say I have one axis and I project all of my data. So right now I will be having my points being just like that. Take a look, we are just projecting the data. A matter of fact, right now our data is, is even harder to separate, because as you can see, once we ignored one of the features and we just projected into one axis, now things are messed up and we cannot really do some separation. Since the goal here is to reduce dimensionality, what does LDA do is that it tries to find the line that maximizes the distance between the means of those two data. So since here I have two classes, if I am to calculate the mean between them, so maybe the mean line of the greens is just here in the middle, and the mean line of the reds is somewhere here, let's say, in the middle. What we try to do is we try to maximize the distance here between the mean. This is step one, but as we've seen, even though we have maximized the distance between the mean, when we project, we will still have a mess. So step one, maximize mean distance but there is one more thing we need to optimize for the scatter meaning that we would like to have less scatter what do i mean by that take a look here the scatter on the x-axis is too large as you can see the data is just spreading along the x-axis and i would like to optimize that for maybe less scatter and we can see that a less scatter is happening on the y direction right because as you can see here it's like we have only two lines lined up where here we have tons of lines lined up right here 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 so the scatter is way larger where here it's just a straight line with the reds and kind of a straight line with the greens okay so here is what we are going to do we need to optimize for a scatter what we are going to try to do is to find the line that works best for these two criteria. So what LDA does is that it creates a new axis, it invents a new axis to project the data in a way to maximize the mean and maybe minimize the scatter. So take a look here. If I am to take a line that maybe looks something like this and I project my data on it now, you'll see that I will be clustering my reds here and I am clustering my greens here, right? Imagine that this line is a magnet and it's attracting all the red and the green dots. As you can see now, the separation is way better. All the greens are on one side, all the reds are on one side. So LDA is all about inventing a new axis. It's not really inventing. It's just finding a mathematical formula to get this best line. So this is the basic functionality of LDA.
And as I said, it is very similar to PCA, but PCA does not optimize for scatter. Actually, PCA is only trying to optimize for the variation where it can get the most variation out of variable, but LDA is trying to find separability between multiple clusters. What I mean by separability? We are separating as much as possible, but with PCA, we are trying to account for the variation of data on the first PCA component. Axes, for example, right? And this is the main difference between these two. Let us now use some LDA to reduce dimensionality. We are going to be importing the following libraries. We have NumPy, Seaborn, we have the discriminate analysis and the LDA namely. We are going to be using some data scaling. We need the PC. We need a PCA just to compare the two graphs together to see the difference between LDA and PCA classification. And we need the train test split. Let's run this and let's start. I'm going to be using the IRIS dataset from uh, Seaborn. So we're going to say data is equal sns.load underscore dataset and we need IRIS. Let's take a look at iris, the flowers. So we have data dot head. This is the data we are working with. We have worked with this data a couple of times throughout this course. And let's see how we can apply LDA to it. We have X is my data. And now since LDA is a supervised learning, we need to separate the features from the labels. So this is my features, it will be all of those except the species. So I'm going to be throwing away the species. Uh, I'm going to, did we import pandas? I don't think so. Let's import pandas, SPD as well. So here I'm going to be, so let us drop this. I'm going to be saying data dot drop. I would like to drop the iris. And we need to specify, sorry, not the iris species. And we need to specify the axis as well. It equals one. And here we go. Now we need the y as well. And the y will be only the species column. I'm going to say here data species is what my y is. Now let's do the usual x train, x test, y train, y test splitting. So I'm going to say here x train, x test y train y test is equal to train underscore test underscore split x and y and let's define the test size to be around 20 percent so we need 20 percent of our data to be tested and that's all now let us scale the data because algorithms like lda and pca like data to be scaled on the same units Maybe for this data set, it's not very important because, well, the numbers are really close to each other. But when we have larger units, let's say larger numbers here for some reason in some of the columns, this is where it will make some difference in our training. Okay, now let us apply some scalar. So I'm going to call here scalar is equal to standard scalar. And then we need to scale the X train and the X test. We always scale our features. We don't scale our labels. This will yield to a lot of problems when you are trying to predict new labels. So X train is equal to scalar.fit X train, right? We need to fit that. And we need the X test to be fitted as well. We want to scale all of our features, be it training or be it testing. And this is how we do that. Now let's continue. We need to create our model now. Our model is an LDA, so we need to pass the number of components. Let's say it is two, the same way we were doing with PCA. Now we are going to say X train is equal to model dot fit. Let's do the training of the model X train and Y train. And now let's do some predictions. So Y prediction is equal to model dot predict x test uh, we did not actually transform the data so here we need fit and transform same way here and here we go now we have 
out some predictions. First, let's see the accuracy and the scoring before we start plotting, all right? So we need one more library, which is the accuracy score. And we are going to say here accuracy underscore score. Then we will be passing y test and y prediction. We need to compile this one. We run the cell. We run the cell. Now let's run the cell. And as we can see, the accuracy is around 93%, which is pretty good. Okay, so this is very good. Now we got a good model that can predict with up to 93% accuracy. How about we visualize this LDA map? Let's do that. The same thing we did with PCA, we need to collect all of our data and just visualize it. How do we do that? Well, we are going to say here LDA transform is equal to model dot transform x, which is my training data. Then let's add two columns, which are uh, LDA1 and LDA2. So here I'm going to say x LDA1 is equal to LDA transform the first LDA axis, right? It's exactly like PCA. Then we will get the second component with the second axis. Now, I would like also to add the Y's to this. Why? Because when I want to plot it, I would like to color the species. So I need to merge my X here and my Y together. How do we do that? I'm going to be calling a new column here. It's going to be species. I'm just reattaching it is Y train. And I'm only adding the training data. Okay. This is only what I want to visualize right now. Then I can do the same thing for the testing data. So let's say sns.lm plot. Then we are going to say here LDA1, LDA2. Our data is my X here. And the hue, meaning that which groups do I want to color is my species, right? Because I would like to see the separation of a species when I am predicting. And let's pass fit regression equals false. Now let's try this. And here we go. You can see that we separated these into three categories and it did a great job actually. All right, and this is how it looks like. Now, how about we compare LDA to PCA? Let me draw them under each other. So I'm just going to copy the whole program. Okay. Everything that we have written so far. And I'm going to just change this to PCA. Because everything else is the same. Now when I run it, we also just need to remove these, the accuracy metrics. And here we go. Let's compare the two graphs together. And as a result, we actually cannot see much of a difference in here in terms of grouping and separation. So PCA can actually replace LDA in a lot of scenarios, but maybe for more complex data, if we have it, LDA could do better. Then why am I teaching you two very similar algorithms? Because they are out there. And sometimes, depending on your data, you might get a good result using one algorithm, and you might not get a good result using the same algorithm on a different data set. So it's very important to have alternatives and try out which would work best for your data set. And that's the main reason we have a lot of algorithms in terms of regression, classification, neural networks. We have a lot of algorithms that we can use and each has its own use case, advantages, disadvantages. And sometimes even a two similar algorithms like that would yield better results on a data set for one of them and on the other would do really, really bad. Or like our scenario here, we got just almost exactly the same results. So it's important to experiment with different algorithms.